Well, it is 6.30, so we're going to get started. Okay, so the first thing is to uh, review and approve the agenda, and I don't think we have any adjustments to be made, unless anyone has some suggestions. Okay, so without objection, we'll consider the uh, agenda approved. Uh, so general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to come address the council on some topic that is otherwise not on our agenda. And uh, if you have something to say, if you would say your name, where you're from, and uh, uh, try to keep your comments to two minutes or less, and that is true for, generally speaking, um, all of the um, comments um, on any regular business item, if possible. Okay, seeing no one hop up. Uh, we're gonna move on. So the consideration of the consent agenda. Is there a, a motion regarding the consent agenda? Oh, uh, Lauren? There were two things I saw. Um, in the uh, March 13th minutes, it still had Donna as the alternate for the Central Vermont Solid Waste Management District, so I think that should be oh. changed. It was, it, was, it was listed correctly in the first part, but then when we were doing it for Ellen's appointment, it said Donna was the alternate. Um, so Why don't we pull those then, because I actually didn't take those, but I other that's things I didn't really close Hey, that. John, can you speak into your mic? Can you Thanks. fire me off an email Absolutely. with a correction, and we can yank them from now, and I'll just tweak that and put them on next time. All right, so do you remember which uh, minutes those were? There were two. Yeah, it was from the March 13th meeting. Shall we just uh, pull that one off then? I'll fix it the next time. Okay. I mean, that's a substantive change. Yeah. It seems like, I guess. I mean, I could just change it. We just move to amend it right now. Move to amend it right now. Sure. After they do. Yeah. It's changed in one place and not the other, right. so I consider it like a typo. That well, that, yeah, that's just replacement. a technical error. Okay. I can correct technical errors. That's Okay, fine. fair enough. Okay. So with that as a change. Uh, is there otherwise a motion regarding the consent agenda? Move the consent agenda. Second. Um, and uh, just to clarify, that's with this. With the amendment. Okay. Uh, further discussion? Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Great, thank you. Okay, so the review of the ordinances. So this, uh, the attachment I know was very long, um, but the intent here was not to um, dive into the substance of the ordinances uh, or the uh, amendments to the ordinances at this point, but to, just to talk through what our plan was uh, going to be to, to take this up, because it is a lot to read through. Um, sh do you want to comment sure. on this? And Jamie's here who kind of spearheaded uh, organizing all this, um, so she has, she's been shepherding everything so you may have if you have questions you can help with that but basically as you know one of our goals last year was to go through all the ordinances and get them updated and bring them up to speed and uh, we finally got most of the way there I think there's probably a few that will come straggling in and we really wanted to know how you wanted to approach those our suggestion if this is helpful is that we do them one chapter at a time at a meeting so we would do like you know because the some of them are, the chapters are pretty quick. They're, they're not that difficult. So we might do chapter one, first reading at the next meeting. And then after that would be chapter one, second reading and first reading of chapter two and just work our way through. And if you know we get hung up on a chapter, then obviously we'll stay with that till we're done with it. But just at each meeting, just try to work our way through one chapter. Some of them are more substantive than others, but really the, the lion's share of them are just clean up. So we thought it would just be kind of a, steady piece of our work plan all, all year. Any comments about that plan? Or you could just approve them all tonight. <laughs> Except you can't. We haven't, didn't warrant it as a hearing. So. <laughs> I'm seeing general, oh, okay, lots of nods, but uh, Jack. I, I think that's fine. I think it's uh, good. Uh, <clears throat> I was thinking some way to space it out over time, whether it's a chapter at a time or something bigger chunks than that but either way uh, much better that that people know if people are at home or paying attention to particular sections they don't have to come in and sit through a whole thing right and some of the chapters will go super quickly and others you know will be longer so 
so would you or Jamie then arrange it in groupings and let us know yeah. which well, ones we'll probably, we're going to yeah. do when? That'd be and great. And we'll put it on the advance agenda so you can see the a, Right. That's what our plan was, well, just but, start with one and go yeah. through. But if some aren't don't have very many, you might group them in a larger grouping. That's all. Never know what will generate conversation. Great. I don't know that we need a motion on that, um, but uh, people are generally okay with this uh, idea to do a chapter. Yeah, go ahead, Connor. Yeah, not just uh, separate, but somewhat connected. I noticed we haven't reviewed the personnel manual since 2007. So we have a few things like the Affordable Care Act that have come in, you know. I noticed like non-classified employees are like required to live in Montpelier. I don't think that's the case. So I think like yeah, we that's sweet to that as well. Maybe that's at some that's point. Yeah. that's in the works. We've got okay. Yeah, yeah that's Sorry. on. That'll be in this year's. It's, it's in the in the pipeline. Cool. Okay. All right. So uh, we're going to move on from that. Uh, so we're on to the uh, Main and Berry Street scoping study, uh, which I'm really excited to talk about. So I, I know we have uh, some uh, consultants and our own staff. So welcome. Yeah. You all have a presentation, is that right? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to vacate okay. this spot. While we're waiting for this to come up, I just remind everyone to use the mics, get as close. Okay. Are these? Those are the yep. I'll try the best I can. Um, <laughs> kind of overcoming the cold here. So we're here this evening with Lucy Gibson and Sophie Suave. Suave, Sophie. From Du Bois and King. Um, they have a presentation for us uh, to take us through the Main and Berry scoping study. Uh, where we've been, where we are, and what our next steps are. Uh, we are not here tonight looking for final approval. This is an opportunity for us to get you up to speed and also Make any comments or questions you have so we can then go back and make any revisions and prepare the document, the, the draft study for final approval. Um, Lucy will take you through the, the next steps that we have that will happen between now and the next time you see this. Um, the, I, I just wanted to quickly rewind the clock back here. Uh, I know there's been a lot of turnover on the council since the bike and ped master plan was approved and, and really this is um, a part of that plan so um, that plan provided this connectivity network throughout the city um, kind of showed where bicycle facil facilities should be what they should be and there was this um, kind of blank space in the middle of it which included this corridor and it kind of said we needed to look at this on its own there's so many impacts here like to, to look at it in the context of the master plan, but, but have its own study. And so that's why we're here this evening, is to, is to fill in that blank uh, within the Montpelier motion plan. Um, the other thing I wanted to um, make a point about is, uh, you know, this is a scoping study. Uh, there currently is no funding in place to implement any of this. There are no permits in place. There are no 
uh, traffic or parking ordinances that in place that would that would back any of these changes up currently. Those are steps along the way after we've finalized our vision, uh, and those are steps that you will be included in as long as as well as uh, different departments at the state level. Um, so I think, without any further ado, Lucy. Great. Thanks. Well, thanks for making time for this. We really enjoyed working with Corey and the rest of the team and the city. And also give thanks to an advisory committee who met a number of times and perhaps may have one more meeting. And Donna was the city council representative and a lot of members from other organizations and committees in town. And we had great um, feedback from the staff and we had the team, more people than listed at Du Bois and King, but our core team was myself, Sophie, and a Julia, who both Julie and Sophie live in Montpelier, so we're also really lucky to have it's an in-depth vocal knowledge. And here is the timeline that we did the study over. It was intended to be more about a 12-month, but we, you know, the project, as you'll see, if we go through, it gets quite complicated. We took a little extra time as we went through to uh, consult with city departments and various committees over the course of the study. And so this just gives a timeline, but we had several project steering committee, or maybe their advisory committee meetings. Um, we met with MTIC, the Montpelier Transportation Infrastructure Committee, and then we also had a meeting with all the city de managers of different city departments. And these were all really helpful, and hopefully we brought all that input, but we certainly, this is a draft, and we want to get um, more input from you all tonight and uh, any further direction that we might need. And so what I'm planning for this evening, because I know you don't want to spend all evening on it, I'll go through a lot of the background parts of the study fairly quickly, but just so you have an idea of all the areas we covered, and then focus probably with a little more detail on what were the recommendations coming out of the study at this point that we really, um, the main <coughs> focus for your input, of course. So we did, in the scoping study, we really did reach out several different ways to get public input on some of the issues and concerns that people had in the study area, which again was Main Street and Berry Street. And we did an online map where people could click online at their convenience and give comments and locate places of concern. And this is a, and in addition we had town meeting day, we had paper maps where people could put red dots for concerns and green dots for things they like and make notes. So we have a lot of good information from what people are thinking and experiencing in downtown because you know we look at it from a professional design standpoint but it's really the users have the best experience that help us understand the issues so from this map it's pretty clear that the biggest red spot is the intersection of Main Street and Berry Street so that was clearly a number one and then a few other hot spots the top hot spots I listed off here, and clearly number one was Main Street and Berry Street, and probably most of these comments in general were more from the pedestrian perspective than the bicycle perspective, because there's obviously a lot more people walking through downtown than biking. And then also comments about people driving too, that we felt unsafe or difficult to drive even. So we have comments from all different modes, but some of the main themes was that at Barry and Main Street, some type of traffic control is needed, and it could be a roundabout or traffic <coughs> signal. And then crossing Main Street at Barry Street is a major crossing, but it feels very unsafe. It's wide, and there's so much uh, chaotic kind of traffic movement that pedestrians don't feel confident that the drivers see them and are going to react accordingly. So it's not a comfortable place to travel through by any mode of transportation. Another really hot spot was just Berry Street itself. And at the time we were doing this, it was around February town meeting day, and I think there were big snow banks, and people really talked about how narrow it is with parking on both sides, and people get their mares taken off, or it feels very unsafe to open your door to get out of the car, and that kind of thing. So there were suggestions of <coughs> get rid of one lane of parking, um, or make it one-way street. <coughs> Different ideas were also mentioned. A third hot spot was the crossing at Langdon Street, and people had observations both from a driver's perspective and a pedestrian crossing perspective that because it's 
during congested times, pedestrians aren't sure that drivers are going to stop for them because they've just gotten through a state and main intersection and drivers feel like if they stop they'll get rear-ended by anxious cars getting through so there's a lot of uh, challenges in moving through this crossing as well and both drivers and pedestrians have concerns and then another concern is with during peak hour when there's a huge of traffic standing there a pedestrian trying to cross sort of slips through the cars and is sort of hidden by the waiting cars so there's some safety issues there as well. Uh, the state and main intersection, there were a lot of different comments, but not necessarily all bads. They were kind of mixed. And then the school and main street intersection was another spot where pedestrians, especially crossing at that location, feel like it's very wide. Cars can get going a little bit fast as they're trying to buzz out of town. And that it's hard to get onto main street from the side street. And a lot of suggestions for always stop like a spring and elm so so that was some of the feedback that we got that was very helpful and then we also heard some and also and really was informed by the montpelier motion plan of there's some challenges riding a bike in montpelier as well there you know while you have the bike paths are great but riding through the streets in the study area again was focusing on maine and barry there aren't bike lanes there's a fairly heavy traffic so people riding might feel exposed if they're not the real confident riders. And then you see a lot of people riding on the sidewalks. And that's, while it may feel safer than riding in the street, it actually can be quite dangerous because every time there's a driveway, the car may not see the cyclist, especially when they're hidden by parked cars from the view of the driver. So it's not a, it's a sign that the streets aren't making people comfortable to ride and instead they're choosing another place that's not very safe to ride. And some of the other thinking about what kind of bicycle infrastructure should be provided for in this central part of town. On the map on the left shows the infrastructure that's currently or planned. There are different shades of colors, but they kind of, you can get a sense that there's a network, but it's sort of missing a hole in the middle. The graph on the right is we don't, we have limited data on how many people ride on what streets, but we do get some data from online bike apps that people use while they're riding their bikes. So it gives you an idea of the places people want to ride are very much the same as they want to drive. And you know, people want to make the connection between the paths and some of the other bike lanes in other parts of town. So again, these are the areas where infrastructure is not there, but a lot of potential demand is there. And another thing that we want to think about when we're thinking about bicycle infrastructure is who are we designing the infrastructure for? Because bicyclists vary widely in their ability. And on the right side of that chart, you have the kind of people that are, have no trouble riding now on the streets. They are, don't mind riding in traffic. They're confident. And then the next group, the 7%, are fairly confident riders. They're probably likely to feel comfortable riding in, on Montpelier streets. But then there's a lot of people that, and these these percentages are average uh, around surveys that have done around the country, so not Montpelier specific, but no reason to think it's different. There's a big group of people that would like to ride a bike more. They are interested in riding, but they're not comfortable on high, what we call high stress routes, where there's a lot of traffic and no designated lanes or space for them. So really to get more people riding in Vermont, which is the vision put out in the master plan, we really want to think about getting those people comfortable riding on the streets or pathways. And then we looked at a lot of different types of infrastructure. This is just a range where from on the left side are sharrows, which is just nothing more than marking a bike symbol on the road, showing, telling traffic they can expect bikes and showing bikes that they need to kind of ride in the lane because there's not a separate lane. And then there's various types of bike lanes with more and more protection as you go to the right on the graphic. I won't go into detail, but to the far right is a totally protected path like what you have in the central Vermont path or protected bike lanes that are really physically separated from traffic. And that's what we call a lower stress facility where a person riding feels a lot less stress and doesn't have to be sharing the traffic. So those are the kind of facilities we wanna to try to look at in connecting 
the Central Vermont path to other parts of town. And then this is a quick review of the design goals that we had and looking at alternatives for addressing this need. Is pedestrians are really the number one concern because there are a lot more pedestrians, again, than probably potential bike drivers and certainly existing. But we also want to provide that low stress bike network to allow a wide range of ages and abilities for people to ride. Uh, we definitely need to consider traffic circulation because they're the two are all related. And another consideration is to maintain as much on-street parking as possible as a key economic and way to access downtown. And then to consider the, all the different modes of transportation. So with that, we came up with four alternatives for different arrangements of bike lanes and intersection designs. And we have, this is for Main Street, and then we have a couple for Barry Street I'll present later. But basically, there are, we'll kind of go over these quickly because they're not, you know, these were studies that we went through, but basically having traffic signals at all the intersections that need a signal, and that would be at, definitely at Barry Street potentially at School Street. We did look at the School Street Main Street intersection and it could be signalized. It has enough traffic to it. doesn't have to be, but that would be an option. The second one is roundabouts at all the intersections and also providing bike lanes. Um, when we put those out, we had a lot of interest in the committee to have a third option, which would be roundabout at some intersections, signals at others, and particularly a roundabout at Barry and School Street. And then the fourth option is really inspired by the Greening America's Capital report. And that was a plan that looked at changing the intersections and parking on Main Street and assumed bikes would use Elm Street and through the Heaney Jacobs lot, I think it's called. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. So I'll do I'll go through these with a little more illustration. So here's the existing conditions on Main Street, just for orientation. Main Street's going up and down, and then Barry Street's kind of on the lower uh, right, heading down in the southeast direction. And then that little orange line is where we're showing a lot of cross sections, basically a slice through the street. And the diagrams to the left is a showing, and I know you can't read all the numbers on it, but these are what we've been looking at carefully, like what is the width between the buildings, and how is it currently <coughs> allocated between travel lanes, parking lanes, sidewalks, et cetera. So that's our existing condition for both the pavement markings and uh, the cross-section. And the cross-section varies a lot as you go up and down Main Street, so it's not the same everywhere. We looked at it all over, but I won't go through all the drawings. So the traffic signal and bike lane option is shown here. And there'd be a new traffic signal at Main and Barry. Um, there could be one at School and Main, although it's not it doesn't really affect the geometry. And basically, this option involves taking away one lane of parking. And we generally done it on the east side, or the right side, hand side. And then that provides space for bike lanes on either side of the street. So that's what the cross section here shows. It doesn't, that all fits within the existing paved areas, because the existing lanes are quite wide and can be narrowed down quite a bit and provide the room for the bike lanes. But we still need to take one lane of parking out to fit them in. So, and then the Langdon Street crosswalk was one of the topics that we looked at and what I'll show here. We looked at a few options to relocate it. So on that diagram, the white crossing right by front of city center is the existing crossing. We looked at one option is to bring it down, basically make it part of the signalized intersection at State Street. Another option was to move it up to the um, alley there, and I'm forgetting the name of the street, but it's a little hazel way. And that, that seemed to be the one that's most preferred, and I think this is probably a topic that might you know, have more ongoing discussion. But that brings it a little bit further from the traffic light, so it's not so abruptly that you get through Main and State and immediately stop for a crosswalk. It'll allow a little more room for cars to stop and not feel as much that we'll get probably not going to solve every issue, but that seems to be the one that garnered the most interest in thinking about changing. So Maine and School was another uh, concern, and again, it does meet traffic signal warrants in terms of its volume, and we 
we were asked to look at an always shot there by a lot of people as comments we got, and we did look at that, but it really doesn't, it's not a good candidate for that because there's a lot of traffic on Main Street compared to School Street, whereas the other intersection that had this treatment recently, which is Elm and Spring, that has much more balanced traffic, meaning the traffic's about equal, and that's a really good place to put an all-way stop, but this one with a lot of traffic on Main Street that <coughs> every car would have to stop would be probably really frustrating and could create rear-end accidents, so that's just not a recommended treatment for that reason, so. All right, now here's the second option, which is roundabouts at all the key intersections and then also providing bike lanes. So when we've shown the uh, Memorial Drive intersections kind of at the edge of our study area but we threw in a roundabout there too. And then a roundabout at Berry Street is the next one up and then a small, and these are smaller roundabouts to fit within the area of the right way. And then a small roundabout at State and Main and then another roundabout at School and Main. And then one of the advantages of roundabouts is that you don't need to have the left turn lanes of the intersections. So you actually can fit parking on both sides of the street and then also have bike lanes. So this option doesn't require as much parking um, removal compared to the signals. And just to wanted to zoom in, this is a drawing from the Greening America's Capital report which shows that many roundabout at State and Main, which is pretty much the same design that we thought is, you know, with the constrained space, that's really the only way it could work. Um, one of the things that's important to realize is that with this design, all the traffic that comes in from East State Street has to make a right turn, and it cannot get into the roundabout just with the amount of space and the offset of the streets. It would basically be pulling in again head-on traffic and um, so this makes a big change in traffic circulation that's important to understand. The other challenge of this is if we had a bike lane coming into it, bikes coming into a roundabout generally either get off onto the sidewalks and share that with pedestrians or to ride through this traffic. And given we're thinking about the less confident riders, we'd expect a lot of people might make the choice to ride onto the sidewalk. And so the concern is you have their big, busiest corner downtown will have a mix of people hiking and walking, which isn't ideal for the people walking to help them to share you know, more congested kind of sidewalk. Obviously, it's possible, but it's a, you know, just a thing to note about how this would work. And then this is just a diagram. We did, along with our analysis, a lot of traffic modeling to understand the implications. And in this case, so East State Street's coming in from the sort of lower right, and because that traffic cannot turn left into continue on State Street or left on Main, anyone that wants to go continue down State Street, we've assumed would take a right and then a left on Langdon and go around the block. And anyone that wants to go left on Main Street would probably take a right on Cedar Street and then around to School Street and then around the block. So this does create you know, a lot of, a bit of inconvenience for a fair number of people that currently make those movements. And so, and I'll just, the roundabout at East State Street, because of this and the sharing, there was a real mixed review in it in our alternatives workshop, so it wasn't, it wasn't beloved, and you know, it's intriguing, but it definitely has some concerns. And because of that, we really were asked to look at a hybrid option that would be a big roundabout at Berry Street, the first circle there, and then also a mini roundabout, or a small roundabout at School Street. So this is what we're calling a hybrid. And then as far as the parking and travel lanes, it's also kind of a hybrid. There's some areas that can have parking on both sides and bike lanes and other areas, especially as you're getting near the traffic signals where we need those left turn lanes, so we have to take parking off one side. So it's kind of an those ways. And one of the concerns of this, of kind of mixing roundabouts with signals is something that is a consideration that currently there's often long queues of traffic either coming from State Street down Main Street or from Memorial Drive up Main Street. And when we
we have a roundabout in the midst of traffic signals like that, the traffic stand flowing through the, backing up through the roundabout will mean no one from Berry Street can move at all as those queues are there. So it can have the effect of making it a lot harder for people to get out from Berry Street. So that's, now that's during peak hour and you know that's maybe one hour of the day or maybe not even one hour of the day. So just a consideration. And then the last alternative was the one based on greening America's capital. So this is a <coughs> diagram of what Main Street was like in that report from Berry Street with the roundabout up to the small roundabout in um, State and Maine. And that, in that case, they actually assumed bikes would not be on Main Street. or they, If they're on Main Street, they'd be sharing the road and there'd be more of a bikeway developed on Elm Street and through the parking area to connect to the bike path. And this involves kind of a reconfiguration of parking. It's not necessarily more parking because they removed some and put it in other places. And it does include, well, it has the Berry Street treatment that matching what we'll be showing later. Show. And then a lot of it's in green stormwater infrastructure and streetscape. So. And then here's just a diagram showing what we were assuming for the Elm Street area, which was which would be part of this option. So for Elm Street to have a low stress bike network, the ideas would become a one-way street. And based on traffic, we'd suggest that the vehicle traffic would be southbound only. And then on the left side of Elm Street, we're showing a two-way bike lane. Now this could be reconfigured to have parking on the other side and the bikes on one side. It's, you know, there are probably a lot of different options, but that's the idea of having a bikeway on the Main Street, on Elm Street, sorry. And then it would be basically some kind of a shared low speed route through the parking area that connects the bike path. And that wasn't too well defined in the Greening America's Capital. You know, it would be a, it would require removing a whole row of parking there to make a protected bike facility. So converting Elm Street to one way would allow room for the bikes, but we did, be, and we <coughs> did have it. We recommend it be one way rather than removing all the parking, because the parking there is really critical for a lot of properties that have no off-street parking, and then you know there will be some traffic impact as it sends traffic to other intersections. So this is the idea of what would happen. So the the purple arrow shows the direction of travel on Elm Street between. Court Street or School Street and State Street. And so traffic going the other way would follow the yellow areas that actually have to go through State and Main and then around the block. And so that's, that is adding traffic to you know one of the bottleneck intersections and adding a left turn, which is even a little more of an impact. So those are considerations, definitely, on traffic. So I'm not going to go through all the details, but we did a pretty thorough review of the pros and cons of each of the options for Main Street and really learned a lot about the different choices we have. And I'll get into more of the recommendations later on. I want to then, then get to Berry Street, because that was another important part of the study area. And for Berry Street, we looked at basically three options. One is a shared use path. They're also called a side path on one side of Berry Street, and it would Involve basically widening the sidewalk to be wide, the same width as a shared use path. And then that, and it could go on, we have, we'll talk about which side of the street it could be on, but it would require removing parking from one side of Berry Street. And that is a continuation of the kind of facility that are going to be, it's going to be beating that street segment on either side, so that was an advantage of that. There is a, another option I'll show, a two way protected bike lane, which is means there's a sidewalk and then a bike lanes and then traffic. Or there's a one-way protected bike lane on each side. <coughs> that one has to remove parking from both sides of the street, so that was one that was not not really pursued further other than to note that it was another option. So, so here is a uh, layout of the shared use path, which is shown in kind of a pinkish line. One of the important things to also note is that the main
main design of Main Street and Berry Street intersection really uh, affects what side of the path, right side of the street, the path should be on. So if there's a roundabout, uh, <coughs> we don't have room for the crossing to all stay on the south side of Berry Street. The idea would be to keep the whole path on the south side so we can get to the rec center and any kids riding that have the fewest possible crossings to make. But with the roundabout right next to the railroad track, the only way is to have people go around the other side of the roundabout, and that's definitely a concern about this option. And then having the path on the north side of Berry Street does actually have a bit of a higher parking impact. That's another concern. So, so with the signalized option at Main Street and Berry Street, we can keep the path against kind of a pinkish line on the south side of Berry Street the whole way. So it really is the most comfortable connection between, and up on the very upper left corner of the aerial, there's a dotted line is where the new path would come in. So it's kind of the easiest <coughs> connection through. And then the cross section shown below basically shows it'd be parking on one side, two travel lanes, and then a be up to 12 foot wide it might the width might vary a little bit but a comfortably wide path to share for biking and people walking and biking to share so this is another option where we are taking not changing the curves or the sidewalks in Berry Street and just taking one of the parking lanes and repurposing it into a, a two-way bike lane and that's the striped areas on the right of the cross-section diagram. And it would need a little bit of a separation from traffic because you do have bikes coming one way and cars going the other way, so you want to provide a little bit of space. This is a, you know, it fits within the cross-section, but it's very tight, and it's probably going to be a design that's not going to feel that comfortable, both for the cars and the people biking. But it can work, it meets the minimum standards. So it will be, you know, in the winter, the winter maintenance of this will have to be really thought through. Will it be plowed? Um, keeping the parked car on the other side as close to the curb as possible is going to be important, which would affect snow removal. So, you know, there are a few design challenges, but it's something that could fit in. And so here are, again, I don't want to go into a lot of detail, but basically there's the shared use path in combination with the roundabout versus the signal, and that really affects what side of the how you cross Main Street and what side of the street the path can be on. And then there's the two-way protected bike lanes. And the one-way protected bike lanes are the ones that are we really didn't pursue further because they it's introducing a completely different type of facility where you have two paths and then one-way bike lanes on either side requiring more crossing. So and it takes all parking away. So can I just ask a clarifying question. Sure. So in any of these scenarios though that means losing parking on one side of Barry Street. Yeah. And it's maybe I'll go back to a drawing here. There's fewer spaces lost when it's on the south side of Barry Street than on the north side. And the thought was that parking on the north side is more important because it's a, serves a church and the laundry map. I think it only goes down part of the way, doesn't it? It only goes to the rec center. I think this right. goes to the rec center, just so you know, it's not all the way down Barry Street, actually. Okay. I think it was eight parking spaces, and there's 13 on the north side. And there's a lot of driveways that limits how many parking spaces are actually there. So I, right. I, I just I would remind the council that we did away with any parking requirements for new structures that are built there in the <coughs> zoning last year. So we need to be mindful that any of those changes would have significant impacts for people who live there and might have a car if there's no parking requirement per per their unit. So here's a summary of the parking from our initial um, run through the options. So the existing is close to 120 on-street parking spaces just within the study area. Obviously there's a lot of other parking, but we've just been focusing on that. And the first option, which was putting in signals and bike lanes, cuts the parking just about in half and basically getting parking off of one side of the street. That's a simple way to think of it. 
the two M2 and M3 options, so it's kind of the roundabouts or combination and that to save, uh, allow more parking to be preserved. And then the greening America's Capital had um, quite a bit more parking because it didn't have bike lanes on Main Street. So, and there are a lot of other things. We looked at traffic, um, traffic modeling and flows and the summary of that is the roundabouts do work better for the traffic flow than the signals. But none of these were really making anything worse than it is now. So it didn't seem to rise to the most important consideration perhaps compared to parking. So this is a summary based on, again, a lot of conversation, probably not unanimous consensus, but of um, where we go with a preferred alternative. And then we also talked about short term because this is some big changes that would be considered in long term. So I might focus first on the long term column and then the different pieces of the study area are listed there on the left. So for Main Street, the long term recommendation would be protected bike lanes and then combined with some access management and other things to both improve safety and also actually increase the amount of parking preserved on Main Street, knowing that's important. For the Main Street and Barry Street intersection, it's recommended that we do a traffic signal rather than a roundabout, and I know that was something that, again, there wasn't full consensus, but one of the really most important reasons for that is that crossing of the bike path is much better under the signal scenario. And another advantage of that is that the city is considering adaptive signal control system throughout the downtown and having a signal there be part of that could really help a lot of the intersections work better where when you have the mix of roundabouts and signals you're not getting that much advantage from that. So for Berry Street we recommend the side path on the south side of the intersect street you know co combination with the signal is a long term. The protected bike lane option could be a short term first step that's very inexpensive to implement. And for the school and main intersection, a mini roundabout there was definitely well received and would be the safest for both cars and pedestrians, people walking, biking, etc. And there's the streets there is quite wide so it has minimal impact. So I want to go in some of the reasons about why signals, because I know there's, you know, a lot of discussion, especially with Reading America's Capital, about roundabouts, but the a variety of concerns that helped potentially tip the balance was one of them, just that need to share walking and biking on the sidewalks around the roundabouts for anybody who's not comfortable riding through the roundabout as a vehicle. Another thing about roundabouts in really downtown areas is they when we look at the plans, it actually requires pedestrians to walk a bit out of the direction rather than straight across from corner to corner that they can with signals. And then there's the traffic diversion issue, especially at the state and main intersection that would be an inconvenience to people. And then the Barry and Main Street roundabout is going to be challenging at the very best just because it gets right up to the railroad. And we you know what dealing with the railroad is like from a lot of other projects. And it's just a very tight spot, so it's not a, it'd be a difficult design. And then the having, again, the roundabout with signals remaining would have potential traffic issues where queues would be backing through the roundabout and kind of locking everything up. And so some of the advantages of the signal option that um, tip the balance is, again, the Berry Street bike path not needing to cross Berry Street. Um, it allows for the adaptive signal control to really have more higher potential in alleviating congestion and um, the coordination with the other signals will reduce. With all of them coordinated together, should reduce stops and delays through downtown. And that wasn't, again, the main focus of our study, but with that opportunity that helped tip that balance. So, And just want to talk a little bit about why protected bike lanes versus regular bike lanes. Um, there's more and more cities that are building protected bike lanes. This is an example of one in Cambridge, Mass. It's obviously on a bigger, wider street, but we, you know, 
our work that we've done, we think they'll fit in Montpelier and Main Street. But it's basically having the bike at the same level as the sidewalk and separated from traffic. Um, Cambridge Mass is deciding this is what all bike lanes should be, and they're actually planning that they're going to convert all their bike lanes to this style, which will be tough because it does tend to impact parking. But um, it's really the best way to meet the goals and not feel your emotion. It's the best practice, safest design, and they've been shown to also really encourage more people to ride, which is one of the goals of not feel your emotion as well. And uh, this is what <coughs> I handed out 11 by 17s. They'll still be required to make a bike class, perhaps, but this is um, what the preferred alternative looked like. The red ribbons there are the protected bike lanes, and the cross section there on the left shows how it would work. There'd be parking on one side, the bikes would be elevated up above the level of the curb. On the side where there is parking, we need a little buffer for people to open their doors, get out of their cars, and not hit the bikes that fits in. And then the sidewalks would be pretty much the same width as they are now. We're not really encroaching on them. And that might vary a little from block to block just because the width, but they'll be at least as wide or wider. And again, here's some examples. That's the one in Cambridge. There's another example in Chicago of what they can look like. They can be a different color to really um, demarcate them from the sidewalk. And then this is just a diagram showing the existing cross section. This is like the pinch point in front of Rite Aid, where you have buildings as close to each other as anywhere. And the existing is on the top, and the uh, proposed is on the bottom. And again, the sidewalks are just about identical. And it's really taking one lane of parking and narrowing the lanes to right-sizing them to what they should be. It gives us the room for that. So we also have a short term. That's like a big change that would take a, you know, a <coughs> lot of work and money and time to make a change like that. But in the short term, painted bike lanes on the street would be a big improvement, and so we have a plan for that as well. And this is just restriping existing pavement. Um, some other things would be providing curb extensions at some of the crosswalks. Um, and the mini roundabout at School Street could be implemented again with more temporary kind of materials. So this would involve, you know, scraping down the nice new pavement that you just put down and putting a new layer and painting it, so it's probably not something that would be done right away anyway, but it could be something to consider as the pavement starts getting a little cracked or, you know, need a refreshment. And this would also be on Berry Street that could be the two-way protected bike lanes that get just, just resurfacing existing pavement. And that could be, obviously it doesn't all be done all at once, Berry Street could go ahead much sooner. And so I want to talk a little bit too about rapid implementation. A lot of cities that are wanting to really build out bike lanes, <coughs> bike networks, are using a combination of you know capital construction and then what we call quick build methods, which is more with paint, flexible bollards, plastic flower pots, other things to help define, redefine the space on the streets a little bit differently to make them safer for walking and biking. And so two of the things that could be good candidates for this kind of approach would be the Berry Street protected bike lanes, which would be the two-way bike lanes on one side, and also the School Street mini roundabout. Um, this could be done quite inexpensively. Here's a few examples of similar projects. Burlington's been doing a lot with quick build, and a, a photos might be a little hard to see, but the top right is South Union Street, where they have plastic curbing just nailed into the road or and bolted in and then flexible posts that sometimes get knocked down and need to be replaced, but they do keep cars from encroaching the bike lane, which is a real big issue there. And then on the lower right are just using paint, um, an epoxy surface that's colored, flower pots and plastic bollards with reflectors. You can create curb extensions much more cheaply than using curbs and more permanent methods, and eventually that might all become permanent, but for now you can get a lot of benefit from it. And then on the left is just a picture from the Sao Paulo, Brazil, where they actually play <coughs> roundabout using these techniques, and there are places in the U.S. that have done that as well, but um, you 
using, you can do a lot with paint and lines as long as you have reflectors and other safety. And there's more and more like design standards to follow to do this kind of project. So we, and as we looked at the refined um, short and long-term alternatives, we did really try to bring back as much parking as we could. So we've got the existing parking is about 120 spaces on the two streets. And we have the short-term option preserves more than 80, I think it's about 85. Exact number, and the long term it loses a few more parking spaces, but you know we basically try to save as many as we can, and that is a net change of 40 parking spaces. And it's you know hard to know the exact numbers till you really go through more of the design with the survey and whatnot. But that would be our estimate of what the parking impact would be. And now cost. So we have. I've now started the short term costs, and then I'll go to the long term costs. So the, for Main Street to basically scrape down the pavement and do all the new pavement markings to put in bike lanes and rearrange parking is a, more than half a million. We're estimating at current prices 565,000. And as we know, prices go up every year. So if you try this in three years, which might be more realistic given the pavement's new, it's probably gonna be more than that. But you know, it's not inexpensive, but that's pretty much just cost of redoing the pavement and redoing it by grinding it down and not trying to rub out the lines. For the intersection to put a short term, put in a traffic light is about 200,000 and that's pretty, uh, it will require some right of way or uh, railroad coordination probably, but it's um, not a difficult project generally. For the Berry Street, uh, doing the protected bike lanes as a quick build kind of approach with just the inexpensive materials, it's a budget of about $50,000. And then the school and main intersection, the mini roundabout could also be done with quick build and we've, we've put in a budget of 20, 30,000. These kind of things could be done a lot more cheaply depending on what you select. So this is maybe kind of an upper limit, assuming you want it with some flower pots and other things to make it more attractive, but it's, uh, it would be possible certainly to do it for a bit less than that. Then in the long term, um, starting with Main Street and building protected bike lanes and doing some you know, curb relocation, stormwater relocation, traffic control and other things is about 1.2 million. Now if you were gonna do that kind of major project on Main Street, you'd probably wanna do more with more tree planting and green stormwater infrastructure. So this cost doesn't include all those kind of elements. We're really just focusing on what is the cost to get the infrastructure for the bikes in place. And it would obviously be best to do this all in one big uh, effort, which I think with the upcoming master planning effort, that would be the outcome of that, is knowing more about what would be included in that project. Um, for the Barry and Main Street, we've sort of divided the signal to be first put a signal in, and then the next estimate of $200,000 is the cost to do the adaptive signal control to tie it in with all the other intersections and make it a lot more efficient. And that's an estimate we got from the provider of the technology. Um, on Barry Street to actually go for the long term and build the side path on the south side is about $250,000. We're assuming it's an asphalt path that involves some relocation of stormwater, a few utility poles, parking meters, that kind of thing. And then the school and Main Street intersection to do a more permanent kind of mini roundabout with curbing, more attractive would be about 175,000. And again, these are costs, sort of today's costs, and they could be, need to be escalated out in the out years. So, and the priority is based on really what we heard from a lot of people throughout the study is number one would be the traffic signal at Barry Street with the pedestrian crossing is an urgent, Kind of low hanging fruit. Number two, the school street mini roundabout, and again, this a quick build approach would be a low cost. Number three, the Barry Street protected bike lanes, and to be timed with when the bike path is complete is really, and so when that happens might depend on all the coming together. And then eventually the side path, and then the 
Main Street design, obviously not necessarily lower priority, but a longer term action that there'd be some more master planning done for the whole streetscape that would be important to find them. So our next steps, well, we'd like to get input from you and any of the city staff is reviewing it and the committee. And by the end of the April, we'd like to get all that input and make revisions. We have to have the report reviewed by VTRANS. They provide the funding for the study. And then once we get their comments, final revisions. And I don't expect major comments from them, so it won't be like I don't want to change everything. And um, try to close out this by the end of May is our goal when there'd be another city council presentation. The one thing I would add to this um, slide is it will go to the, um, the Transportation Infrastructure Committee again before okay. it comes here. So that is what I have, and I have those questions I have to answer, or maybe for nothing, but you know, <laughs> you'll have time to digest it. Well, thank you. Um, I think this is very exciting. Uh, this is a really big deal for our community. Gosh, one of the things that we hear a lot about on the council is um, just complaints about uh, traffic or feeling safe on the streets or uh, uh, anyway, any, all, all things uh, traffic related. So um, one of the things that I was curious about with the next steps, <coughs> excuse me, um, I, I, I know you've done a lot of outreach to the community, uh, and I, as a resident of Berry Street, I, rem I remember you um, soliciting input from uh, people in the area. And I, um, one of the things that I'm, I'm very interested in uh, is <clears throat> now that there's some uh, sort of preliminary uh, results that are out and some suggestions to talk about, I would love to... Um, have, especially for the, the Berry Street uh, implications, I would love to uh, have some kind of a meeting, um, ho like host some kind of a event, maybe at the Senior Center to say, hey, hey, Berry Street community, um, you know, here's a, a plan um, and some, some ideas. What do you think about this? And uh, uh, just continue that, that dialogue. I don't know if that, if you feel like you've already done that, but I, I think I, I would find that useful just to have that experience even myself. Um, so I just want to put that out there to you all that that's something that I'm going to um, offer up my, my time to, to do probably when school's out. Um, so sometime in uh, mid to late June, um, you know, try to have some kind of a, uh, a Berry Street uh, community meeting about um, some of the Berry Street particular, particularly, um, you know, some of those, uh, those implications. Uh, so that's one thing. Um, other comments or questions from the council? Uh, Connor. Um, you referenced sort of like a uh, one-way Elm Street there, but I didn't see any, anything for Elm Street on the recommendations. Does that mean just leave it as oh, is? Or? Yeah, we <clears throat> recommending having the bike lanes on Main Street, which means Elm Street stays as is. Okay, thanks. Because that, um, that was part of the alternative that didn't and just, just a question of public input, I, I think, uh, first of all, I, I agree with the mayor completely, just to, as far as having a really robust conversation. And I would expand that to talk about, you know, when I canvassed on Barry Street, there were issues about lighting, you know, how many rubbish bins there were for, you know, I, I think a lot of people are feeling a bit neglected there, so maybe you could be, you'd be in a sure. broader conversation. Sure. Um, as far as public input, how many responses did you get on this? And I know that's not maybe easy to say because some of it was the interactive map, some of it was the town meeting day stuff, just kind of trying to get a handle on that. I think it was in the hundreds. I don't know if okay. you saw the dots on that. Okay. And that may yeah. not have been a hundred different people. Great. And there was a, it there was was a good a, response. I'm sure if you mentioned this, there was a, uh, a alternative presentation to the public as well mm -hmm. that was held here. Um, and we had also videotaped that meeting and offered it on our website so people could bring it and add comments on the website. That basically presented all of the alternatives that you saw to the public. Right. Yeah, and then it's also kind of workshop where we had them all printed out and people could drill into them and put post it notes with their ideas or tell us their ideas. So, so we're very open to input and it's hard to cool. always get everyone that wants to <laughs> eventually have something to say. But. All right, others. Um, Donna. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I would just, I, I 
as a, as a former Barry Street resident myself for many years, um, I think that we actually need to take this out to the neighborhood. I, I think it's a really, it, I realize that it's eight, eight spaces, you know, is one of the proposals, but that in, in reality translates to people just parking further down on Barry Street where residents park because not all of those units, particularly the ones closer to town, have parking, um, which segues into my second ask, which is, I know how the council voted last time, but it was a split vote that we reconsider the, the parking requirements in um, not the designated downtown core, but I think it was that, that outer area um, because there are places there that, that don't have parking and you're still paying Montpelier rent, but you have to have a car if you need to work anywhere other than pretty much Montpelier. Um, so I, I would hope that if the council is really going to consider this one that we would all make the effort to show up in the Barry Street neighborhood to talk about why this is important, but that we would also um, be willing to have another look at what parking requirements are going to be for dwelling units. Because if you you know work in Waterbury or even in Barry, you know I, if I have to work late, I can't take the bus home. So just I would like to shamelessly plug that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Donna. Well, actually, actually, I support re parking requirements everywhere because it forces business owners to then get creative about transit, remote parking. Right. So it's not just residential area. So you have my support there. Hello. I am <laughs> definitely am very disappointed because only since this very last draft, suddenly roundabouts lost because of state and main configuration. And I'm still pushing for roundabouts. I have traveled all over the world, and particularly my lots of visits to Sweden, in the smallest areas with odd shaping streets and intersections, the roundabout works. And I've found a whole lot of examples, but I don't have all the degrees. So I'm still pushing for roundabouts because this is very decisive. If we don't put roundabouts in because of one intersection, when we could put them not only all the way down Main Street, but ultimately in the Barry Montpelier Road Memorial Drive, it roundabouts really work. Not only does it slow down traffic, but the statistics, some 75% less of any kind of injury crashes and interchange, 35% as far as movement of traffic improvement. So I'm just a roundabout supporter. I was there when the first one went in, and people said it couldn't be done for all sorts of reasons. And I know engineers have the final say, but I know there's some that do support them in odd places. And so I'm still searching, because I really want that opportunity to have them all the way down, because they really make the whole atmosphere so much different. Once you have a signal, all your other roundabouts won't work as well. So it just is a really much better flow. So I'm still there. I'm also supporting the shared path on Barry Street. I've had a lot of those in Europe and Sweden where bikes and people use the same space. So that on Barry Street, from the intersection of Barry and Main down to where you take the rec, rec building and go back to the bike uh, shared use path, I really see that as a way to use the limited space without taking so much off the road and still being safe for people and bikes. You have signage that says shared, it shows a person and a bike. It works um, in very much larger places like Stockholm with a lot more traffic. Um, so I think we could do it here. So those are my two biases. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jack. Oh, and then Glenn. Oh, no, no. I've got a few, th few, few observations. One, I'm with you on roundabouts. I don't know all the places they should go. I definitely see them on the uh, Main and uh, School Street intersection. I see pushing them out uh, State Street also. I think uh, Bailey Avenue is an intersection that could be, the signals could be replaced by a roundabout and possibly Elm Street also, which is a, which is a difficult in intersection a lot of the day. Um, one of the things that I thought of, that I did in getting ready for tonight, and I don't know if this is something you looked at, but uh, I, I uh, talked to Fred Wilbur, whom many of us know. Fred uh, owned a bookspieler for many, many years. And a few years ago, he came out with a proposal to improve the pedestrian experience in the center of town by, uh, I, 
I'll, I'll pass this out. It's, it's, the idea is basically to uh, take um, the whole space from uh, the State and Main intersection to Langdon Street and turn that all into a pedestrian zone for the pedestrian cycle of the, uh, of the traffic light. And I don't know if anyone's looked at that uh, seriously. Fred spent time on his own trying to promote this. But uh, <clears throat> while we're looking at how to redesign the uh, pedestrian and motor vehicle uh, interactions, I think it's worth at least making this part of the conversation. As, as I think of uh, the uh, Langdon Street uh, crosswalk and uh, relation to the state and main intersection, one of the concerns that I always have is not whether I'm going to be rear-ended, but uh, people using the crosswalk um, drive northbound traffic on, on Main Street back into that intersection. So, uh, so that ties things up in a way that it makes, it makes it hard to get through there. And the, the other thing that's a real peeve of mine is people driving southbound <coughs> on, on Main Street. Uh, when the light turns red, they, uh, they block Langdon Street. They don't uh, <laughs> they don't stop uh, at the crosswalk, and again, that ties up traffic because people who would be turning left onto Langdon Street can't uh, can't make that turn because just one person has decided to pull right up into the uh, into the line of traffic, and so those are things that I, I'd like to see uh, see us address. Um, first, I want to echo the mayor's uh, thanks for the presentation. It's really exciting and great. Uh, I've been thinking about this for a while. I use almost this whole area daily as a pedestrian. I, I um, walk down from my house on Prospect Street on the other side of the river to the drawing board and then down into downtown all the time. Um, and I think that you've identified a lot of really good options. I want to register my general philosophical support with Donna's for roundabouts and Jack's. Um, I do, the, the, the reasons why not a roundabout at State and Main make sense to me. Um, it does seem really awkward to make everyone coming off East State turn right. Um, I can't see an easy way around that one. And uh, also, if it's, if it's true, and I see no reason to disbelieve it, that putting a roundabout at uh, Main and Barry means that the bike path has to cross the street and go on the north side of Barry Street, that also seems like a, a pretty big negative. I think that the bike path should not have to, to cross over there. Um, in general, I like the, the suggested path forward. It all looks pretty good. Um, I'm curious if the, and this is sort of like what Jack was saying about the, the main and state intersection stretching up to, to Langdon Street. In M1, uh, there's the, the kind of uh, off rectangular area of that whole intersection um, set up as free pass zone while the walk light is going. Uh, so rather than four separate crosswalks, there you, you can cross from TD Bank straight across to La Brioche, or that is diagonally across to La Brioche. And that seems like a good element to me. Um, and I was I was curious why that element did not continue through into the other options, if there's an answer. I don't know if there's really a final determination. I think that could be, and it's not a big yep. change. We did right. look at some other more significant right. changes, and you know, everything. 
things on tight. So yeah, yeah. I, so that and it's hard to see with the light, but that could certainly be yeah. incorporated pretty easily with not much change. I think I like that. It feels like a good element. The other thing I'm curious about is um, I spend a lot of time down at the bottom left at the uh, the um, Memorial Drive Main Street Northfield intersection, waiting for that light, and. Uh, I would love it if that were a roundabout, but I, I mean, I can imagine if the next intersection up isn't a roundabout, then that's going to be problematic, as you described, because then the roundabout gets packed Probably up. Probably not so much for that, because we don't, the Berry Street volumes are not that high, yeah. so we don't expect long queues. We don't yeah, expect okay, that to be a right. bottleneck. It's more that when you have the bottleneck at Memorial Drive and at State, those spill into okay. Berry Street. So, so I think a roundabout at Memorial could definitely be on okay. the table. And it's, you know, because that's on the state system, it was sort of the edge of our study. Right. Area. Yeah. Could yeah. Make a strong recommendation either way, but I think that could be something that could be amended. I'm in favor of that. Can I just ask a clarifying question? The, uh, so making a roundabout at Memorial Drive makes it easier to have a roundabout at Barry and Maine? I think they're Is that what not you're saying? really related. I think Memorial Drive could have a roundabout regardless. Regardless. Of the okay. And because, and the reason is because Berry Street would not be expected to be a bottleneck in, yeah, okay. that forms queues. Okay. It's more that the queues from the signal back into Berry um, I think, oh, so I'm going to call on myself here. Um, I think that's very interesting um, for Memorial Drive. Um, I, am, I, I will offer that I'm a skeptic of a roundabout at Berry and and Maine uh, because of the uh, proximity to the train as well as the implications for the bike um, bike path. I'm open to so being convinced, um, <laughs> especially if you have some examples uh, particularly near um, uh, interfacing with trains. Oh, yeah. um, so that's, uh, that's one thing. I, I also just want to uh, make sure that I remember to say that I um, appreciated that you have a, a list of uh, implementation priorities, because obviously, even with the uh, short-term, uh, um, you know, possible projects, we're not going to be doing all of those all at the same time. And uh, and I, I agree that uh, figuring out the uh, Barry Main Street uh, intersection is the highest priority. So whether it's a roundabout or it's a signal, that to me also um, floats to the top. Um, of the, the things that we should be doing. And it, you know, if, the, if this timeline holds and we are able to have some conversations um, you know, with the Berry Street community over the summer, um, we should be potentially in a good place to talk about that in time for the budgeting um, season for uh, the, the next fiscal year. So I uh, just want to make sure that that's all on our, our radars as well as we uh, queue that up for, for next budgeting cycle. Yes, Donna. Oh, and then Lauren. I, I'm just asking about timing. You keep talking about the Barry neighborhood in June. You wouldn't want to do that before it goes to back to the trans. Well, I guess we could. I'm just thinking like oh, that was me being no, no, you know no, realistic I'm my own <laughs> schedule. <laughs> but um, but if that would be useful to you, um, then we can try to do that um, well, before May 31st. May. Right. <laughs> okay. So they want it by May and they consider it done. That doesn't mean we can't adapt it. Doesn't, it doesn't exactly. Right. I but this is a just so project. I just yeah. wanted you to be understand there's a final product due yes. in May. Yes. Yes. Okay. That's. Right. right. Unless you, you, we still have decisions to make right. once yeah. we. Regardless. So you're just trying to finalize the report, then we have a process for making decisions. Yeah, you're not by no means obligated to do everything in the report. Right. If you accept the report, that we yeah. did and I have one um, f uh, further question about that, just to clarify. So I mean, at least in your presentation, for the short term um, cost of the Barry Main Street intersection, it was uh, two hundred thousand dollars, and then the long term um, solution was two hundred thousand dollars. Is that because it's uh, it's, it's not, it looks like it's not totally the same. It's not um, the same, no, and it's just coincidence. Okay. 200,000 for the long term is really tying all the signals together. Okay. So is that, and that's you if, know, that's a lot more benefits and, and yeah. Than okay. Interesting. So potentially if, if we spend $200,000 on the one before the traffic signal only, um, and then we decide to do the long term, um, then, then we would be spending an additional $200,000 to replace or update um, whatever signal had been put in? 
No, with the, the new signal would be capable of being. Okay. So it wouldn't. Okay, so that's not a new no 200,000. Oh, okay, just wanted to make sure. So the signals are 200,000, the coordinated signals are another 200,000, and then the path on Barry Street's another 250,000. Right. right, no, I'm not talking about the path. So it is a, it, you're saying it is a, an additional 200,000. Right, there's 200 to coordinate all the signals, and right. then 200 just to put the initial signal. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. okay. So, yeah. but it wouldn't yeah. have been a wasted so 200,000 the, the first time. To okay. Coordinate them. So oh, okay. Hardware, software. Got gotcha. you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, that was helpful. Oh. Appreciate that. Oh, and uh, we got Tom and. Uh, unless it's. Well, unless my it's question short. has to do with timing. So. It's true that once you report oh, the you. Re report in and you get it, you still can change it. But is it also not true, I'm asking those who apply for grants, if you apply for a grant to get money to help do some of the things in this study, does not AOT look to say, well, why are you changing this or that? Do they, not, do they challenge it or is it, is it okay? Because often they ask what you've done and whether you've studied it. Right, but you, I mean, I think you can make amendments to it. I mean, I don't think you can radically change it. So we did this study. This gave us the alternatives, the pros and cons. We've selected this, but we modified it slightly because of these reasons. I mean, that's, you're still, they're still evaluating the project that you're applying the grant for. Yes. Okay. Um, Tom and then Lauren. I, I assume your thing, Tom, had to do with what we were just talking about? Uh, more general. Oh, okay. Actually, I'm going to go to Lauren then yeah. next, if that's okay. Um, so I am also a general fan of roundabouts. It sounds like a lot of roundabout love here. Um, I, I'm hearing the concerns with the Berry Street. So one one thing I'm thinking about is it's intriguing this kind of low cost option for the roundabout at School Street. And um, a, I'm just thinking like sequencing the kind of comfort in the community and would also just urge public outreach with the school like as a parent driving to the school a lot and that is a horrible intersection when you're dealing with that and so just thinking of outreach to the school and the parents that are doing that drive every day and getting input and um, you know hopefully building some comfort if we're going to go that route with with that so that when that goes in hopefully it's a success and people really like it and um, maybe that's something we could do yeah. try to do sooner than later and then you know see how the community is um, responding to a roundabout in general. <laughs> cool, that's a great idea. Uh, Tom. Hi, so Tom McArnold, Public Works. Um, just a few things. Um, one on, on the costs, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think these are more order of magnitude yeah, kind of levels sure. of planning level, uh, planning level sure. until you get into design. Um, it wouldn't be conceivable, for example, very main, whether it be a roundabout or signal could more than double that cost once you get into actual design. So just keep that in mind. These are just numbers to give you order of magnitude. Uh, we all know where these costs can go. Um, and another is um, we did look at uh, Memorial, Maine, the Route 212 intersection as a roundabout. We had uh, a well-known roundabout expert, uh, Howard McCulloch, uh, do that for us a few years ago, several years ago. Um, and that is still on our website. Um, if, you're, if you'd like to look at that, um, what that would look like. It's a high volume traffic. It's a partially two lane roundabout. Um, there are access issues and, and fitting it out circle into a square hole. We all know how difficult that can be. Um, and although I've tried. Um, <laughs> so mostly the roundup, uh, the, the gas station access, the ledges, the proximity to the river, lot of constraints there to consider um, it is workable but it, it's um, that is a high impact high cost roundabout um, and lastly uh, back to what Donna was talking about as far as roundabouts and signals not necessarily working together um, it was actually the same person and other roundabout experts who pointed out the benefits of sometimes having roundabouts and signals working together in unison roundup our uh, traffic signals create, tend to create platoon flow that can be beneficial in how we organize traffic and how, they, how it arrives at intersections and roundabouts are constantly spitting out traffic and um, so they're, they can actually work to the benefit uh, when they are um, a roundabout, a signal, a roundabout, depending on what the traffic engineers sees for um, what they're trying to accomplish, what the, what the 
issues are, how their driveways are intersecting, a lot of different things that need to be considered when looking at that. So roundabout is one tool in our toolbox to, to manage intersection traffic flow. Um, it's not the only one, and I think pedestrians are, are a big one. Um, and, and as under the ADA, um, for somebody who's visually impaired, uh, locating a crosswalk um, and not having those visual cues um, is something that also is, has had a lot of attention lately, and they've actually signalized some roundabouts. Um, there are roundabouts <coughs> that have been removed um, because of pedestrian and bike issues. So. Um, there's a lot that goes into the, to the decision points of this, and, and, and so I would just, I was on the, on the fence about roundabouts when we started looking at them 15, 20 years ago. And I can see that that is one tool um, that we should consider all of the implications, all the constraints that we have to, have to work with. So. Uh, uh, question? Sure, go ahead, Donna, and then Glenn. I, I just, because of that expertise about roundabouts and lights, what happens with that extra long pedestrian crossing time that we have? So that's in the middle the, of all of that. Yeah. So that's the negative side of the of the of a traffic signal is there's a lot of wasted time. There's the clearance time, the yellow, and then the all red time. Um, the pedestrian crossings are timed for the longest crosswalk, and they just increase this limit. I think it's three point one seconds um, or feet per second. So for an aging population, so there's a lot of time. Um, the, the interesting part about Barry of Maine, um, that, that signal timing is, is designed on the longest crosswalk that's out there, but if we were to run a crosswalk from La, Bio La Brioche over to Cool Jewels, a lot of people do it, but we would have to time that signal for that 3.1 second uh, feet per second, which would be a very long Time. So that's the nice thing about roundabouts is there are there's no wasted time, there's no clearance time, there's no all red time, and pedestrians cross one lane at a time and then have those safe refuges in between the lanes. So um, so that's the distinct advantage of a roundabout over a, over a signal. There's no wasted time. I hope you ask about also the adaptive signal technology. That was what I was going to. That's, uh, <laughs> uh, I think that's exciting new technology. It, it, um, it's important. I think the number's wrong, though, on that. I believe the estimate we got is 300, um, not the 200. But that included memorials. OK, so you did that. All right, so, um, so adaptive traffic signal technology is, just as it states, uh, it adapts. It's smart technology. It adapts to actual demands um, with video, um, true video technology and there are algorithms to help the <coughs> to communicate between traffic signals um, so one traffic signal is speaking to another one it's a figure of speech um, and so what that does is it, it takes it will take a traffic signal phasing um, out of sequence to respond to traffic demands so if you're all familiar with the main and Barry intersection, you know that the pedestrian phase always comes up after East State Street. There's no car on East State Street, and it'll go right to the pedestrian phase. Adaptive signals will um, adjust based on actual demands. It will know that a vehicle's been waiting on East State Street, but I'm not going to serve that now because I know I've got platoon flow coming from this intersection that's in sequence, it's coordinated. I've got to serve that first. I'm going to fit in this East State Street couple of cars over here. I've got a pedestrian waiting over here. I'm going to fit that in, and then I'm going to let these other cars come in, and it just constantly adapts and sinks. And that's to me, is far more efficient. It's going to take some getting used to, because if you're waiting, we'll start stepping out of the crosswalk, and, yeah. and you know, East State yeah. Street just went, and it's like, oh boy. Um, <laughs> so you actually have to take care, to, you know, actually look at the cues that you're being provided. So some of the results that we've seen from this at similar it looks like we could probably expect somewhere between 20 and 40 percent less. Um, hey, Corey, could you, could you speak into oh, the mic? Sorry. Yeah. 20 to 40 percent less stop delay throughout the corridor, and also 20 to 40 percent less stops for vehicles through the corridor. Yeah. And that's what makes it really exciting. You, you don't have those cars stopped idling unnecessarily at intersection. People are moving. Um, less wasted time for those clearances. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so my particular question on the adaptive uh, signaling, which does sound really cool, is 
Uh, is there any data on how robust it is? Uh, it feels like it depends on a fair amount of software always working and all of the connections working and so on, where, for example, compared to roundabouts, all it needs is the shape. You know, you don't need any tech. So. You don't need to call Tom on the weekends when it doesn't work. <laughs> For example. So, I mean, obviously. Challenge accepted, Tom. <laughs> I, that gets old real fast. <laughs> I mean, I imagine that these signals, the adaptive signals, are relatively new. There might not be a ton of data on that, but do you have any sense of what we could expect with that? Or So there, there's always a fail-safe with these systems. So they'd go back to either um, localized control over that intersection if there's a network issue, or it would go to um, the old traffic signal systems, which were terribly inefficient, which is a, a fixed time. So everybody gets 30 seconds on this street or 10 <coughs> seconds on this. So there are fail-safe systems. Um, State of Vermont is using that now. They just installed one in Waterbury. Um, and where else did they tell us, Corey? Yeah, they have one. It's been in place for a few years now. So not much in Vermont, but it's being used widely, so. Okay, I would love to uh, open this up to the public if the uh, public has any comments, questions. John Snell, uh, I'm mainly a pedestrian, have mainly been a pedestrian, but of late with a bad knee, I'm driving more, so I play both ways. Um, the, one of the questions I have is, can anything be done to reduce traffic on Berry Street coming into town that would make a difference? I'm not sure if you mean to reduce the volume. The, the volume of traffic, yeah. So, well, that wasn't, I guess, in our charge to book, so. And in general, yeah, and in general, options. are you are you forecasting increased traffic volumes, or is it the same, or will there be a reduction? We looked at the forecast generally as for increased based on growth and development. Yeah. So, so we well, did use that. In our I'd theory. love to to see whether there's any option for taking cars off Berry Street and putting them on Memorial Drive, uh, Berlin Street, uh, instead. Closer bridges. <laughs> What's that? Closer bridges. Closer, you could do that, yeah. Plant trees. In the well, actually, <laughs> you know, one, I'm not a traffic engineer, but just anecdotally what I hear from people is I think, and, and you know, this is, this cuts both ways because the, the Granite Street Bridge is one of the most historic bridges in the yep. state. But it is a very narrow bridge, and I think people are dissuaded from using it. A, a more functional bridge there might then create another traffic alternative for people rather than going all the way into town. But I don't, you know, I don't know how that models out and the flows and all that kind of stuff. But I know a lot of people don't like using that bridge. Uh, can I can I jump on to your question there? Sorry, I don't want to interrupt you yeah. here. You know, um, <laughs> I forgot to ask. Um, was one of the things you considered making Berry Street one way? Or was that not in the... It was never seriously considered at okay. all. It was a suggestion. Okay. But given there's, I think someone said Stonecutter's Way, but the amount of inconvenience mm -hmm. is really beyond what I would ever recommend because, you know, one-way streets can work when there's a block, so you just have to go around the block. Sure. It's a long... So it's a long way. There's not a lot of cut-throughs. want to have people go all the way up Elm Street. And everyone would have to Spring turn Street left onto Stonecutter's to go out that way yeah, yeah. from Maine. Yep. So, okay, yeah, thank you. I just want to make sure I asked that. I think we consider at the beginning. Yeah, it was definitely a suggestion. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, uh, Ashley. I would just, I would assume in conjunction with this would be some traffic calming measures, particularly in like the Berry Street area, some raised tables or something along those lines. <clears> just, <throat> I, I think with the addition of some new commercial properties that are coming in that are supposed to attract more people, you know, that's that's sort of a straight shot if you're coming from downtown Montpelier and headed out to the co-op or to Caledonia Spirits, you know, as someone who's lived there, and I'm sure the mayor has seen this too, people fly when there is an opportunity to do so down Berry Street, and there are lots of 
families, children, you know, scofflaws like myself not crossing on a crosswalk, you know, but it just in terms of, you know, making sure that we're doing this like holistically traffic calming, I think is, is a, a pretty clutch piece in that area too. Uh, Jack. I can, one, uh, I have a friend who lives on Barry Street and he just talks about how scary it is to try to cross at some of the crosswalks because of uh, traffic. Uh, I can also report that from at the uh, Montpelier Transportation Infrastructure Committee uh, last week, we spent some time talking about the process of developing our uh, traffic calming policy. And so that, that is moving forward, uh, criteria and process and everything. So it's definitely something that's in the works. Okay, thank you. Tom, did you have something more? Yeah, just quickly on the uh, traffic volume question, um, and uh, Lucy mentioned that you forecast um, an increase. Um, those forecasts, um, you can speak to the to the actual trending that we've seen over the last 10, 15 years of actual flat line or decrease in traffic. Um, so we continue to design for a 1% or half percent increase in the design year, but reality is we've seen the numbers drop significantly, um, particularly Main Street, uh, Berry Street. I don't have the latest from uh, regional planning, uh, but is, can you speak to that, Lucy? Is that sure. what you found? There was a we looked at the trends of traffic. It was also interesting to look at a study that was done, I'm going to guess in 2005 maybe, that had forecasts of traffic for now and were way lower than what they were forecasting. And there's a lot of reasons for that. We're seeing that all around Vermont, that um, it's partly an aging population. People are moving through their years where they drive the most into years of their life where they don't drive as much. Um, there's just the economy changing. There's all <coughs> There's probably a lot of different factors for that, but traffic is flat even though there is growth, so it's not because we're not growing at all. Yep. And then, and I know the, the roundabout on Memorial Drive, that study was done even earlier, and that forecast a huge amount of growth. And it did actually require a larger roundabout for that, but we feel like we can get away with a smaller roundabout than that study was mm. suggesting because we're just not seeing it. So we did look at there's still a recommendation that maybe 1% per year kind of growth is what you look at. So that's the kind of growth we, it's kind of a safety factor more than a real observed trend. Mm -hmm. um, Great, yeah. thank you. Uh, Glenn. Just on, on that, to, uh, that's really interesting to hear also because early in the uh, draft that got sent around to us before the meeting, um, there's a little graph of pedestrian volumes on Main Street, and that also goes down. So it, it's, it's, I don't know what to say about that, but it, it sounds like we are getting less pedestrian traffic, less car traffic, and somehow more people. Uh. <laughs> so, and I, think, I would say that pedestrian, Everyone's we only home. have counts at one point. And okay. maybe there was a store that was more popular, okay. more people so, walked by, yeah. and then people are going. Okay. So we're traveling, we have a lot of counts all over, so we have a much more robust set of data. So hopefully <laughs> we'll bring them back with some. The yeah. best yeah. counts are always so erratic. Hi, I'm, I'm Eve Jacobs. Jacob. Yes. I'm Eve Jacobs Carnahan. I'm on, I live on Sabin Street, and um, really glad to see this proposal. I worked on the Montpelier in Motion Plan, which is referred to as the Bicycle Pedestrian Master Plan. So it's great to get to this stage. Um, so I would really like to urge you to move toward a long-term solution in the short term, like sooner rather than later, because if we make these kind of bold revisions, whichever version you take. This is the kind of thing that's going to attract people to Montpelier by making it really a livable city. Much, um, you know, we have little sections of shared use paths, bike paths around, and they don't connect. And we have, um, we're going to, we have a friendly ish downtown, <laughs> but there's all these terrible places to cross the streets, and there's all sorts of broken sidewalks, and I'm, problems with that. But if we do these kind of bold revisions and really improve the streetscape, that'll make visitors stop and stay. And 
it will make people want to live here who don't want to depend on cars, the generations of people who don't buy cars all the time. So I think that is really, really important to move quickly out of the short term and head to the long term solutions as soon as, pos as possible. On a couple of particular things, um, there's been conversation about having Barry Street community give input into the um, actual proposal. I think the whole city needs to give input into it because it is a proposal that will affect the life of all of us. It will affect how everyone moves through town in a car, on a bike, um, by walking. And especially when we have the um, new shared use path that's going to come and end up at next to Shaw's, all of those people who want to get onto that or come off of it are going to need to cross um, Main Street or go along Main Street and I think we've got to have input from everyone about the actual proposal because it's the next stage of having input in the planning. So I think you should think more broadly about having some kind of forum that everybody gets to give input into. And um, there's a couple of particular things that I'm curious about. Um, I looked um, just in the last day at what was available through the agenda, and so I haven't digested all of it, but I think it'd be helpful to highlight in all the Main Street versions, the M1, M2, M3, what it's like to cross Main Street on a bike or a, as a pedestrian, because I couldn't easily compare all those, and it looked as if some were easier than others based on whether where the bike, where there was a crosswalk and what happened, and it wasn't always listed as an advantage or disadvantage. And then another question I had is whether the um, evaluation took into account any possible impacts from the parking garage that is perhaps going to change some traffic patterns and put people, draw people in or out in a different way than happens now, and I didn't know that. I couldn't see, but I didn't look at all 47 pages. Well, thank you. That's a great suggestion about the uh, broader community weighing in on the. Is is there? Can you tell us whether you took into account what the new parking garage might have as an impact? Well, we really just focused on what the changes would be from the bike lanes, and it's knowing that there is a potential, you know, additional parking resource. I was and thinking the traffic pattern because you were talking about things like no, volume traffic of traffic. Movement. The traffic movement, we yeah, would not. it bring people, yeah. like, especially if you have, if it means people coming on Elm Street, um, I guess you sort of ruled out some of the Elm Street changes, but if people are having to come from East State Street or from Main Street or from Elm Street and go through one of these intersections, to get to or from the parking garage, then that may have an impact on which of these versions, whether it's a roundabout or something that allows you to turn right or go straight or not turn right or go straight. That just might be more critical than it might have appeared if you didn't have a funnel of extra cars going through there. But I don't know if that's going to send more cars there or not. I just wanted to be sure it was thought about. Thank you. Yeah, good question. Yeah, go ahead. Oh. Or <laughs> Hi, Mary Messier. Um, I missed uh, how long it is between this, this process where you present the ideas and where this actually might come to some decisions. I missed, uh, is there a timeline for that? I, I couldn't quite read the, um, the printing there, mm -hmm. project timeline. So uh, they're expecting to have the uh, final uh, form of the report done and presented to the council by the end of May, so May 31st. And then uh, the council, like we were sort of uh, mentioning that uh, we'll probably have our own process to decide um, how we prioritize uh, the projects or if we want to actually do any of them. And then it's likely that that might be built into the um, any, uh, you know, first steps to, um, you know, pay for any changes that are, um, you know, that are the highest priority um, would be built into the, the next year's budget, which would start in, uh, yeah, 2020. Okay. The, like July of 2020, at the soonest. Yeah, I was just thinking about, you know, um, and I'm new to this, but the time period where where people give a lot of suggestions and then people work on 
um, the ideas and the planning. <clears throat> and then from there, where people can look at those ideas and planning and say, do we want this or not? And, and I think that piece ought to be a, a good piece of time with the community, too, to review all these things. Because this is a lot of information in here. It's a lot of changes. And I, w I will hope that's uh, enough time for people to uh, to really consider what's being proposed. You know, I mean, that's what a lot of things are up against, a lot of decisions and stuff. In the long run, I wish there was no traffic in town, no cars. I wish we had like eight satellite parking areas from the different directions coming into town. And I wish none of the State Street, Main Street, you know, none of this section had cars. And I think we could accommodate that with other vehicles that aren't cars and um, accommodate people with disabilities and uh, with uh, vehicles that may be electric powered that can carry five or six people from satellite areas into downtown where they can walk, bicycle, ride a scooter, ride a trike, you know, ride a horse, ride a mule. <laughs> what, whatever works, because uh, in the future, too, the 30 years out or 20, um, we probably won't have these kind of vehicles that much, you know. Um, I don't know how long it'll take, but there'll be a lot of big changes coming in, so I hope that, that's my thing for the future. I hope that downtowns don't have to do all these roundabouts and all this stuff, be, for cars anyways. Thank That's my you. two cents. Thank you. Uh, Stephen Whitaker. Uh, I'll drive the first Uber mule. Uh, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> uh, I think that we are realizing the limits of our planning when we have too many variables in the mix. Uh, we don't know whether we will or will not have a garage. We don't know whether we will or will not have a train. Uh, reducing load off of Berry Street <coughs> via the, a bud car coming in from Pioneer Street is the logical and immediately available solution. Um, so I understand it's a very complex calculus with maybe too many moving parts. But one thing that came to mind is we need to decide sooner than later. Decide, y'all need to decide sooner than later is whether in the process of all this construction, we are gonna potentially adopt the ideas that, that I mentioned earlier of the, the architect who went blind and made his city so accessible to blind people through textures and grooves on the sidewalks. I think it's, it's a brilliant application to Montpelier. We've got such a friendly, perfect city to become you know, the accessible capital for the sight impaired, you know, and provided we could do it safely, but it, it takes a comprehensive, systematic, citywide design at the same time so that we don't miss an opportunity of each section of walk going in level stable with the proper grooves and the proper textures to aid that kind of navigation. Uh, I'll reference you back to the 60 Minutes episode that, that detailed all this. Um, there's privacy implications to the video of adaptive uh, traffic signaling. Who gets that data and, and for what purposes? Um, distinguishing a plan from a concept. We've basically got a concept now. And taking that all the way to the planning level is something I'm running into with, you know, a state house wiring plan. It's a concept, it's not a plan. And do you start building? And what are the repercussions or potential pitfalls of starting to build when you don't have a plan? Um, the historic bridge, the Grand Street Bridge, I noticed in Richmond, they took a very historic bridge and they strengthened it and expanded its width. They added one more section. Uh, so it might be a model worth considering for Grand Street. It's enough for now. Thanks. Thank you.
Konstantinos Tavaros. Uh, I'd just like to say that um, in terms of getting hung up on things like parking, we should be thinking about what we want our city to look like in the future and what kind of transportation we will be having. So for example, there is a microtransit pilot that will possibly be happening sometime in the future, I think in the next year or two, uh, which would probably reduce the amount of traffic on there. We currently have, I think, about 1,100 people that live within Montpelier that commute to work also in Montpelier. So those would be probably a good cohort of people that would be served by good public transportation, therefore reducing the needs for parking. Uh, downtown, so we could have more space in our downtowns for human activity and less for you know, inert hunks of metal just sitting on our streets. So I think just thinking into the future, what will our city look like should be something we need to consider. Um, and so roundabouts, more bike lanes, different types of transportation, less of the single occupancy vehicle should be something that we should be pushing towards. And uh, sorry, where are you from? Oh, I live here in Montpelier. Okay, great, thanks. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, I'm also on MTIC. I was on the Great. steering committee Super. for this as well. Thank you. But awesome. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> Super. All right, any further comments? Well, this is very exciting. It feels like we are at the beginning of um, uh, further conversation and uh, looking forward to having those conversations. So uh, to be continued, thank you all for your uh, work on this. Uh, I know you've spent thank you, thank you. so much time on this. So. Yeah. Yeah, very grateful. Uh, all right. How are we doing, team? Do you need a break? Yes, please. Okay, let's take five minutes. All right, uh, we are going to um, come back from our break. And so the, the next topic that we have here is uh, uh, revisiting uh, our tax stabilization policy. So we have a, a draft that uh, we have for consideration. I'm going to turn it over to you, Bill, to. Um, introduce this or talk through it or sure. um, yeah cool over the last year one of our lists on our strategic plan was to revisit our tax stabilization policy as you know the last couple of meetings we're hitting some of these finish up items and uh, and certainly we've had a couple of applications which had some good conversation which helped inform what um, people thought were important or concerns about the policy tried to give you the history of its its um, approval and support and the, the statute that's behind it, examples of some of the awards. And then I drafted a policy with help from Laura from MDC and also the comments that um, you all made in, at council meetings. I certainly don't expect that you're going to adopt it as is, considering some of them say, should we define this better and those kind of things. But wanted to get a sense of what you know what you liked about it, what you don't like about it, what uh, what you know really. When you're, if, if we're going to continue a tax incentive, it really should be to reward what we want to reward. And I think you know, looking back in the history of that, um, and particularly when you see it's a sort of pre 2003. I mean, the, the city's sole goal at that point was just to expand the grand list and add jobs. Period. And so that's what it was used for. After 03, of course, the state law changed. Uh, which took away the ability for to stabilize uh, school taxes. And even though it went up to a 50% for 10 years as opposed to 33% for seven years, it was still a lot less money for people. So it's really been used a lot more sparingly in that time uh, until, you know, ironically, it's just we've had two or three the last couple of years, but that's been the exception rather than the rule. But nonetheless, I think, um, it's been kind of on our radar to try to update this anyway. It's been since 2003. And so basically get a sense of what's, what's important uh, amongst, you know, I'm not going to read through everything that we changed. I think what I tried to do um, to at least lay out was, first of all, make clear that this also involves commercial housing. The, the language said industrial or commercial properties and under the definition of commercial properties includes commercial housing, but I don't think it was clear that people could do this. So people building new commercial housing or renovating commercial housing would be eligible for that. So we want to make sure that, you know, given our emphasis on housing, um, obviously we talked about jobs and I added in the environmentally responsible uh, department. So I just tried to make those things clear as we went down through. Um, try to simplify the awards. We used to have this huge smorgasbord of awards and, you know, really all everybody ever wants is yeah, I mean, it's just people always want the best one at every level, so let's just call it what it is. Um, and 
then tried to add in, and these numbers were just ones I picked, but just to add in specific, uh, inst you know, th that the creation or renovation of commercial housing units. It struck me after the last meeting that we were talking a lot about the condition of housing and should we have housing inspections and all that. It's like, well, why not create an incentive for people who, you know, redo an apartment building and make it safer and better and those kinds of things. And so make it easier for people to do that. Um, tried to define a couple things. You know, there are some clearly some areas that need further development. Um, and that was it. I, one of the issues that had come up was, you know, what what are uh, good jobs? Like, what what's the job standard? We, you know, and I had talked about the state's, um, uh, excuse me, um, livable wage. And so one idea, and I talked with a couple of you after the last meeting, was, all right, well, you know, if we don't like what the state says is a livable wage, we ought to at least hold ourselves accountable. We do have the livable wage policies, but that whatever our sort of lowest full-time wage, um, we obviously must consider that sufficient to work in Montpelier. Uh, and so that, um, that that would be the standard by which somebody had to meet or exceed. And that, um, and that if there were no benefits, then we would add basically the benefit cost to that so that it was equivalent. And, um, and, that, and then that would be changed. Each year we would just publish, this is what the city wage is for January 1 for this coming calendar year, and that would be what people have to meet. And that's something we can control. If we, if we want to incre you know, increase that wage, that's something we would do for our own employees and then would set the standard for other people. And then I just listed things under the top level, but again, those could go wherever you want them to, that had been mentioned in this room as, as areas people wanted to see. So energy efficiency, historic preservation. I thought it might make sense to create an even better, you know, you can reach one level with one level of jobs and a separate level if you have either, either more jobs or jobs that pay above, a premium above the, the city wage, so to speak, and then, of course, additional housing units. And the rest was mostly, I think, clean up as far as language. So, you know, those were the general thoughts I had and hopefully were reflecting thoughts that you had. And from that, where do you want to go? Connor, and then Ashley. Yeah, maybe, maybe a couple of the legal beagles can help on this one, but um, I, I voted against a couple of these, and like, sure enough, they, <clears throat> they actually met the definition on, you know, all accounts there. Does the city have any legal liability if we were to refuse one of these, uh, but they met that standard? It's explicit that it's uh, discretionary. Okay. So if that's the case, like um, financial benefit to the city, that would be just completely subjective, you know, if you looked at it. Or um, what about like, okay, so the project would not be in Montpelier without any stabilization. I remember like timber homes that came up and so we took yeah, that. You, just, you just asked them, right? And <laughs> they said, no, we come here anyway. So game said match in your mind, but um, like, how do you prove that? You so I, I actually took that section out. Oh, you did? Okay, yeah. Because um, we've struggled with that every time. Yeah. And I think part of that has been our own, um, our own other requirements. So we, we required people to have their permits in hand prior to seeking tax stabilization. And that's a, you know, for a big commercial project, that means there's some engineering design, there's, you know, architectural design, you've got to go through your permitting process, bring your experts. You've already got a fair amount of cost in. You've probably acquired the land or have lease on the land. You've made a commitment. So, so to go through all that effort and then say, well, we wouldn't come here, especially for just for the municipal tax, you know, it was, it was a stretch. So. I think we either, if we're going to require that level of preparation, I don't think it's, you know, it's just not a fair question. On the other hand, I suppose you could reverse it and say, prior to seeking your permits, you come in and say, here's my concept, here's my budget so far, and I can't really go forward with this. That might be another way to do that, and then we could make that determination at that level before they go down the road. And, uh, and my thinking was, and again, doesn't mean it's the right thinking, was if, if we're going to sort of have them already go through their permits and come in, then what 
what are the incent what are we getting and so really hit the the renovation of apartments and and reward the behaviors that we want to see as opposed to just you know you're coming in but we also want to see grand list ex you know uh, what, what you know when you go back to the economic development strategic plan for instance one of the things that it called out was that there had only been an increase of 10 p private sector jobs in Montpelier over I think the last decade and that was you know called out we've had public sector jobs you know just this last one that we approved is 50 private sector jobs coming into one one project so in terms of at least that goal that was one that was being met now if that's not as much of a goal for us then here's our chance to put our money where our mouth is and so. I have, oh, Ashley. have a long list of thoughts <laughs> Um, so one thing, um, I appreciate that MDC was involved in this, um, but I'm hoping for a more robust group of people at the table to come up with a plan like this because um, tax abatements mean that residents are supporting the infrastructure bill, for example, when projects are coming in that are going to have people driving through Montpelier. Um, you know, there's going to need to be improvements made to other areas, other things in our community that these businesses need to be here. Um, and that means residents are in essence paying that. So I, I'm, I am, um, I would love to see more people at that conversation table than just, uh, you know, the sort of economic side of things. And, you know, I think, I think there need to be like residents there. There just need to be a lot more perspectives um, at the table when we sort of talk about how this policy can be um, redesigned. So another piece that um, I don't see in here, and I don't know what the appetite is, um, but I know, for example, with Caledonia Spirits, there was an infrastructure piece that the city invested in, and there was uh, tax abatement as well. And to me, the infrastructure upgrades are pretty significant in terms of you know the the benefit that every person can derive from that right because if you're building out sewer and you're building out access to city water and things like that 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 sort of opens up other development possibilities um, but I really struggle with the notion of doing both infrastructure upgrades and tax abatement I I would love to see some some election you know like the city, you know, can approve up to X amount in infrastructure, you know, if there's a problematic intersection or we need to build a sidewalk or a whatever, um, then, you know, the city is willing to sort of put in that, but is not going to, to abate any sort of taxes or, or some hybrid formula wherein the um, maximum sort of city investment, and I consider a, an abatement an investment because it's revenue that, that we're losing, um, uh, I, I would like to see some sort of um, further development of, of what those options are because if we're going to spend $10,000 on infrastructure upgrade and we're abating taxes for, you know, a, I don't recall off the top of my head, but um, that's a pretty significant uh, investment for the city, which translates directly to all of us are paying for that. And it's something that will certainly bring other people in, but that's going to be wear and tear on the roads and increased traffic in certain neighborhoods. and. Um, so I love that we clarified that commercial housing is included in part of this. What I don't see in here, though, are any protections for renters in that. So it's great that commercial housing um, exists. I think it's a it's uh, one way that um, folks like myself in you know not here in Montpelier because I have been incredibly lucky that I have a great place to live now. Um, but you know, okay, that's great. So we, we want to encourage and incentivize people to maintain their properties well, but how do we make that affordable still? So, you know, you go in and you make, I think one of the, one of the tiers was $350,000 in either renovations or new construction. Um, but then if you're going to turn around and charge, you know, $2,500 a month in rent, you're certainly creating units and making them accessible to some people. But I don't know that that really furthers our goal of actually making Montpelier reflect our shared values. Um, can, I, can I just interrupt on that just to be yeah. clear? It's $350,000 of an investment or mm -hmm. 
renovation or creation of four more commercial units. It doesn't mean you have to spend 350000 on those units. Right. Well, so, but either way, you know, so if we're abating taxes and the rent there is, like, so completely out of reach <clears throat> mm -hmm. for the sort of median renter demographic, that's not something that I have any interest in, in putting taxpayer money towards. So can I play devil's advocate on that? Mm -hmm. Because if somebody renovates, we want people to renovate their properties or build new housing. Mm -hmm. And the cost of that's going to get passed along to tenants under any circumstances. That is true. So the disincentive would be to just leave them the way they are and keep the rents down. In this case, at the very least, if they have reduced taxes, that savings could be passed along to the tenants if they, from the improvements of their properties. Well, that assumes a degree of altruism I mean, that well, I, I, I'm I don't know. Well, I'm just saying that, I mean, we could just, we could not include housing as an incentive. Um, but I don't know. I mean, maybe there's another way. Maybe there's rental subsidies or something else we could do. I don't know how in well, this. I think it would be that rent wouldn't, you know, rent would not exceed, what, you know, whatever the, the median rent plus X percent or something. You know, I, I, I just I feel like if we are going to incentivize that kind of development, we should be incentivizing that, but we can't be incentivizing that at the at the price of pricing out the people who are already living here. Because you know, if you renovate and you invest three hundred fifty thousand dollars, or 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 you re you know whatever, whatever you yep. meet your threshold dollar amount wise, and then you know I get I get my I get my you know offer to renew my lease for the next year, and my rent's going to go up seven hundred dollars a month because well now the apartment will command that i can't stay so i, I want to be mindful that incentivizing on the one end often translates to significant disruption on the other so i think we so i, I guess i just push back again and say i think you need to so it's the difference between the current value and the new value and the municipal tax on that. So, you know, is the savings on the taxes enough that's going to create the difference between how much I think it might incentivize someone, but does it, you know, if they improve it $700,000, you know, they're going to save whatever they save. It's the investment in the property that's going to drive the rent, not, not the taxes. I mean, I think. But, so. but they're getting other taxpayer money and then they're pricing out renters who have who have been established there. So, yeah. so that goes to the question of, is there a public interest in having people improve their properties then if it's going to drive rents up? Well, I, I, I think the answer is yes, but we as a city have the ability to incentivize the kind of development that we are looking for, which is the kind of development that makes our units habitable, but that also does not further marginalize communities that have been historically marginalized in Montpelier anyway. So... What are the other things on your list? Yeah, a bunch okay. of them. Okay. And I'm not sure what the best way to do. I also went sort of section by section with suggestions, so I don't know. I, I, um, yes, Jack. I have and a, direct then, respond, a couple of direct responses to what sure. she was just saying, so this it. might be a good time for that. Um, with the housing, uh, I was very pleased to see the uh, housing in there. I think what we things we can do to encourage housing development are good. <coughs> Um, it's already a tiered uh, <coughs> structure, and I can imagine adjusting it so that uh, you get one level of abatement for uh, housing, because um, I think we've seen some new housing, new rental housing that has been, that rents out at pretty high rents, and yet I think we would agree are beneficial to the city to have the new housing. And I think that we could set it up so uh, in order to qualify for the higher tier of benefits, you need to satisfy some kind of uh, rent affordability uh, test. Similarly, if the, uh, if the housing that we're looking at is uh, improvements or renovations rather than new development, I could see us uh, having a condition of uh, rent stabilization or non-displacement for, uh, for a number of years, the way that the uh, uh, weatherization program, for instance, says that you can't uh, get the, all this weatherization money and then 
kick the people out who are there. So I, I think there are ways to address some of these concerns. I'm uh, um, just while we're interrupt, uh, not interrupted, but uh, pause here. Any other co thoughts on uh, housing? No. Okay. Back to Ashley. Um. So let's see. I'm also. Uh, I am really struggling with the notion that you apply once for something and can get a maximum possible ten years. Um, that just seems like an incredibly long time with, you know, zero oversight. Um, so I, I think that's just sort of a, a more general point. So now, uh, let's see. So uh, let's see. Um, one I thought was uh, fine. Um, there were, so in uh, number two uh, in the conditions, let's see. Um, so I'm also wondering, I think it was 2G. Um, let's see. Um, uh, any awards will be made for the entire application. It's that last sentence. Mm. Uh, I'm not fond of always and never. I think those are always the wrong answer. So we see what we were trying to get at, which is basically assurances that that um, if there is an approval for one, the approval will be for the other. But I, I also struggle to, I mean, I can foresee a set of circumstances where people have an application for one that meets the guidelines, but the other one doesn't meet it. And I, I, I'm not going to be in a position where I support one aspect, but the other isn't met. But it says any awards will be made for the entire application. Um, so, so we might we might be able to just word that differently. My my goal wasn't really that. My goal there was that you don't get to um, get your building approved and then come in the next year and say, oh, by the way, we now want our personal property. We forgot to ask for that. And, okay, that and makes so, way more sense. And so sense that you're then. basically you've got to ask for it all when you come in and that um, so that it would be and that you can't ask for business personal property unless you're also asking for a new building okay. so you can't so some that makes way more although sense. In, you know I suppose if somebody renovated a building and then came in and said well then they could ask they for the they could qualify. ask for the renovations but they were bringing on all new personal property I was really thinking more if you just have a business they f do all, all put in a whole new personal property and come and say now we want tax stabilization on it we wanted to see a bigger investment than that. So I was just trying to basically say you've got to put it all in one package. So so, so I, something I, that's, that makes way more sense to me than, than how I interpreted that. Um, it, right. And in essence, that sort of precludes people from getting the second bite at the proverbial apple. <laughs> um, so... Uh, with regard to um, finding this findings of fact uh, is page two number seven. Um, before approving a tax stabilization contract, the city council shall make specific findings of fact on which to base the general findings that the project meets. Um, I think we need much more clear guidelines about like what exactly it is because. You know, I think ev every time this has come up, there have been questions about what kind of jobs, how much are they paying, you know, what are, uh, what, you know, how are we defining this? And that seems to be a bit too subjective for me. If, if we as a city are going to um, continue to have any sort of tax incentive like this, I think that. Um, we have an obligation to be very clear in what our expectations are, and part of that to me is also being transparent with residents about what it is that we are all paying taxes for. And so, you know, to to be sort of told that, that's, you know, a, a request about what the wages look like or what, you know, what tier the jobs are in is intrusive. Um, I mean, frankly, I, I think we have a right to know what kinds of economic development we are supporting because I'm not super interested in supporting, you know, jobs that, that don't pay enough for someone to work full time and support a family. Um, so uh, I, I would say that those findings of fact 
we need to do some work on that section and, and really articulate, uh, maybe we need a definition section to, to sort of clearly, you know, articulate terms of art that we use. Um, and I think that was even mentioned <coughs> later on um, in, in this document. I think we could, um, maybe not necessarily in the findings of fact section, but under the certain criteria like the jobs, was I think is probably the most difficult one. Mm -hmm. The rest of them, I mean, the grand list we can pretty easily ascertain and the number of housing units those are pretty simple right. um, we could simply say must you know we could put in a criteria for documentation that we require I agree with you that if people are at using that as a means for asking for tax break they ought to be forthcoming even if it's you know presented as a confidential document that isn't sure. for public release but that at least the council can be right. you know so I, I think yeah. that might be the way to do it as we could say so many jobs at this rate as documented by Right, and, and I think that's the other piece too for me, and I'm not sure if that's sort of like the, the spillage over of being a lawyer where I'm like, prove it. <laughs> I mean, cause, you know, because words are great, but I want, I want to see like what exactly it is that we are supporting. And, you know, if we're supporting, well, I've, you know my laundry list of things that I'm not super interested in supporting. Um, Okay, so the next thing that I really struggled with, I have no idea what other people's thoughts are about this, but the, uh, the award amounts to me, I don't know what this looks like. This is not my, I mean, policy-wise, I, I have ideas about this, but I, in, ter in terms of like economic whatever, um, I, I don't love that it's basically up to 50% of the value of that piece of property because, you know, when we were doing our budget numbers, you know, we were debating, you know, the addition of a $40,000 this or a $60,000 this or a $90,000 this. And to me, this sort of benefit is to a business is a benefit not realized to community investment. Like this is a sense of community investment, but this isn't gonna put in a sidewalk because we're not getting that entire tax payment. Um, and so one thing that I had sort of thought about, um, and I don't know how to phrase it, so I couldn't really come up with anything super helpful on Google either, um, but looking at what our total grand list is and then pegging the maximum possible tax abatement award for all projects at a percentage as it, so you know I'm just going to use simple numbers because math is not my best thing so let's say we had a million dollars I know our grand list is much bigger than that but if we had a million dollars and we said uh, that we would alloc you know we would not abate any more taxes than you know, 1%. I'm still not even confident I can do the math on that. But, um, what, 100,000? Is that right? Am I right? Yes? No? Maybe? I don't know. Is that right? 1%? No, so it would be a, a $10,000. $10,000. $10,000. All right, look at that. Well, it's a good thing I can laugh at myself. Um, you know, and so, so however it is that we decide to do it, but if we sort of peg it to a percentage for a year, then we as a council are also going to have to be a little bit more mindful about how we are going to allocate these projects. Um, we, you know, we, we, that was the answer that we gave. I, was it the, was it, was it the community fund when, when they came in last, last year, like there, there were bigger asks and we just said, you know, we don't really have the money to, to do that because this is what we allocated. And I know that that's a, a different, it's, not really apples to apples, but I think the concept is, you know, we agree that as a, as a community, this percentage of our grand list is what, you know, and there's obviously going to be an increase because there will be new taxes paid, just not all of them. Um, you know, that, that might be one way to sort of tackle this from a, a different, you know, instead of, you know, every person that applies for it can apply for up to the maximum you know, 10 years at 50%, um, just just some sort of like benchmark for this is what we are willing to forgive this fiscal, you know, this fiscal year and this is what the impact looks like going forward for that so that we can sort of keep that rolling tally close to 
if, if we decide to set a limit. I'm going to pause here. Mm -hmm. um, we've been, uh, I appreciate that we're going sort of linearly through this, but I just want to check in with the rest of the council. Any comments on any of the sections we've that uh, been talked about so far? Yeah, Donna, do you have a question? She, she's covered her lot. At one <laughs> point, I thought you were at Section 8, Benefit Levels. And you yes. talked about years. I did have a concern about years and wondered where the 3, 5, 10 came from. That would be helpful. If so the um, 10 years is the maximum allowed by law and, and has been approved by our voters. So 50% in 10 years has, has been locally approved. Uh, the prior level had been one-third for seven years. That had been the previous limit, so that seemed like another landmark to you. So basically, um, these were taken from the last policy, which just had all those different levels, and I just took the top level. So we had set one-third for three years as the lowest one, then one-third for seven years, then a half for seven years, and then a half for 10 years. So there was just a gradually increasing amount if the more they provide. Um, so that's, that's where, I mean, there's no magic to these other than that's based on what we did in 2003. Well, and maybe, Laura, you could chime in. I mean, I thought, you know, businesses per se, you look at a, anything new, a new project, new business, at least five years to level <coughs> off. So I wondered if infrastructure-wise at 10 years was a magic number or something, because I'm uncomfortable with that long, and I just wanted to understand why. Sure. for a development. Um, in Montpelier, we tend to have longer holding periods uh, for... Could you define that, please? So that's the time that a building is built um, and that developer holds on to the building and leases it out. We're kind of a unique that we have a lot of developers that continue to own their buildings, so their hold period is much longer. Um, so 10 years, they're, they're calculating, is it 10 years, 15 years, plus that I'm looking to make that money back or kind of get even, like get to stabilization basically. Um, so Montpelier is a little bit unique that that longer time frame um, that also allows developers to invest a little bit more and um, be a little more, uh, I don't know what the right term is. Um, yeah, I'm not sure how to explain that, but actually the 10 years is realistic for a hold period, if not longer, in our market. So that would be beneficial. So on yeah, part yeah, of that question was within our own strategic plan, mm -hmm. and we were compared to Waterbury and Northfield, does that 10-year, 5-year, I mean, what, what's the regional sort of time period? That I'm not sure, um, and it really depends on who the players are um, and who, like, who is operating and developing in those different communities so when we're looking at the level of how we compete with Barry or Waterbury um, it's I don't know on that that level of granularity I think it's also important to add in here when we're talking about that um, one of the reasons why this has been in place for so long and I think been supported is, is that our property taxes here are significantly higher than some of our neighbors particularly Berlin um, you know Barry's municipal taxes are rates are higher than ours, but I don't know about their property values. Um, and so part of this was as we compete for places, we could still end up with the same infrastructure demand if people are, you know, located right over the town line and still driving on our roads to get to and from it without us getting any of the tax benefits. How do we create an incentive for somebody to locate in Montpelier and make that investment here and at least help Equalize. I know with with Caledonia Spirits, it was very it was a huge issue for them because they were looking all over and they just said, you know, th your difference in taxes is really a, a financial killer for us. And so, how could we make that so that they they could come in? And so, you know, just to give you an order of magnitude, talking about what what Ashley was talking about, you know, a million dollar increase to the grand list um, would be about a twenty five thousand um, dollar annual tax rate. So there would be a twelve thousand five hundred dollar tax cut but it would also be 12500 new money to the, the tax bill. So that's the order of magnitude, and that's really the range, and so anything under that is less than that. So that's the amount of money per the application we're sort of talking about. We're not, you know, I don't, none of these are sort of $100,000 tax cuts. They're, they're much, much lower than that. Thank you. That's helpful. Other comments on or questions on anything up to Section 8? 
I should good. I should say I do, but I think I'd rather just let Ashley keep rolling for okay. now. My question is a little bit more general. Okay. I'm not trying to steamroll. No, no, no I think you're doing okay. great. I just figured it'd be good to <laughs> check in. I saw you. Oh, um, so, yeah. Go ahead. Now, now is okay. <laughs> jobs from Berlin to Montpelier. So it wasn't bringing workers from New Jersey to Montpelier. The people weren't going to move. They're not going to, it's not going to change. Those people are probably going to live in the same places. So I was trying to think through, well, what's the point of giving an abatement when the business is already just eight miles down the road? And I don't totally understand why you do that, because I am very concerned, as Ashley and Connor have both asked, about are we giving away tax revenue that we could be using for the infrastructure of the city streets and the, um, um, you know, all the services that we provide. So I thought I think you want to tighten up things that have to do with the jobs and think about what's the real goal involved in them. So that's my piece. Of Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Go ahead, Ashley. Um, and and to Eve's point, um, that's actually that was that was the next thing on my list is um, so jobs coming to Montpelier. So to me, when someone phrases it that way, there's X number of jobs coming to Montpelier. My first thought is not those are new jobs that are created as a result of a business m coming to an area. Almost all of these have been jobs that have been transferred from other people. So most, the representation was that most of their employees would be coming with them. Um, and that's great, but that is not generating additional employment opportunities in Montpelier. It is certainly creating positions that if people vacate, that, that could be an opening for another person in Montpelier. And so while we get to count those as jobs added in Montpelier, it's not actually an expansion. Like they're not creating additional positions. They're just taking all of their workers who are working in this building over here and moving them to this building over here. So it's, we can, I, I guess I, it's nice to like read that and say, oh, Montpelier added X number of jobs, but th those aren't new jobs. Those are existing jobs that are restructuring to Montpelier. Um, the other piece is, and I love that um, the, the language about the wages piece um, is in here. Um, and uh, I would also, in <coughs> addition to the, um, you know, the number of jobs, I think this was in 8A, although it seems to me like maybe some of this stuff is not really in, like, total order, because you see. I'm not sure what you mean by 8A. So, hold on. It, it's on typewritten <coughs> page three, like the first page three after the memo. Oh, yeah, there's, there, it, it, there's like a repeat, that. and so I, I can't tell. The numbers. Yeah. So the criteria for level two. Oh, I see. Uh, that's, yeah. that's, because the next one should be yep. nine. Yeah, so this is really, it's really okay. section 10. Yep. Gotcha. Oh, that means the rest of my notes might be wrong. And this <laughs> is we'll section 11. Um, okay. So uh, I would also like, as part of any requirement for this is to have a reinvestment in Montpelier plan. Like, what are you going to do for us? Because, you know, 
okay, you're, you want to relocate here. You're telling us that you're not willing. Well, I mean, one of the criteria had been, like, you wouldn't do this otherwise. I, I'm, that, that, to me, seems a, a bit murky and um, questionable. And I, I appreciate that we got a candid answer, which was like, well, we're going to do it anyway. But this. They took it out. No, I know. But, like, in, instead of sort of focusing on that piece, like, what are you as a business going to add to Montpelier? Because, you know, I, I've lived in other places, and, you know, we see box stores going in, and box stores serve a function. It's, it's a practical reality. But I'm not super interested in continuing on a path where we are just doing whatever we can to attract businesses that aren't really adding anything to what we want Montpelier to be. You know, we can bring in CBMC jobs that are coming eight miles down the road, but we're not bringing in new people living here. Like, it's not adding to anything in our core downtown. Like, what is that adding for people who focus their time, energy, and efforts in this community, which is largely concentrated here? So um, I, I, just in thinking about the question, um, in my interpretation of this, uh, the reinvestment in Montpelier, let's say, is is what the criteria are for levels one through four, right? So theoretically, if they can meet uh, some of these criteria, that is how they are giving back. And if we think that this list is not enough, then if you have suggestions as to what they ought to be able to meet, then mm -hmm. that's fair. Um, and for example, I mean, like actually to, to Eve's point about like the location of the jobs, um, you know, uh, under uh, level three D, um, project must be located within the boundaries of the designated downtown or growth center. So that's, you know, that's, uh, if we have a goal of uh, growing our downtown, uh, you know, we can, we can build it in right here. Like this is how they're giving back. Um, and so, you know, in, in terms of, um, I would I mean, just point out that's actually for that they have to meet two of those criteria, mm -hmm. not so. Well, so that's okay. I mean, maybe we reframe it as like you have to do all of them. I mean, I, but then we should probably think pretty hard about like which of those things, um, you know, we want to require. But maybe it's okay that, uh, you know, they're meeting. Uh, the point is like, are, are the, is this the right list um, for that purpose? Because that, that's really, you know, why these criteria are here. Uh, and maybe it's like, I mean, maybe what you have, uh, maybe what you're thinking about is like, um, you know, that we will we'll build a sidewalk over the next, or we'll pay for a sidewalk over the next 10 years. Like, or, so Timber Homes or, had some definitive things that they were gonna do. They were going to clear a, a portion of the land and put a picnic table sure. out, and then Caledonia Spirits, yeah. had, you know, they're creating waterfront access. Sure. I mean, those to me are, definite public yeah good. so how do we I mean maybe that's a it's sort of a project by projects you know how what that might look like well, I think but they should tell us sure what. but maybe in here we could have one of the criteria be um, you know just a little more um, a little more general it's like you you know you propose something. <laughs> Do you know yeah. what I mean? I mean, um, well, and I think that's sometimes how you end up with things that, as a city government, we wouldn't necessarily sure. think about because that's not the yeah. world that we necessarily operate in. Um, uh, Lauren? Yeah, just kind of on this point, um, I mean, I was thinking a lot about, you know, to me, kind of to Ashley's point of, you know, if, if we're looking at the, the city budget, where would we put this in our priorities? Like, would this be something that we would just automatically want to always have a certain amount we would dedicate to? And to me, it seems most interesting if we're able to use this as an incentive that's getting developers to think about kind of helping us meet our goals. So, you know, we've talked some about housing as obviously being a big goal. We have a net zero goal. Um, we have other goals that we could think about. So can we be writing this in a way that you know, somebody can come make the case to us, um, and even this incentive itself would get them thinking about, here's how I can shape my project in a way that is furthering the goals that we want to meet as a city, and then us being able to gauge, okay, this feels like a good use of taxpayer dollars that we're not getting, um, because it's actually helping us achieve our goals, and that we're putting a, some, I, I think the more tangible we can be about what that looks like, so that it's like, 
real to the people who are trying to meet it and mm -hmm. for us to be able to assess is this um, you know some of the language of aesthetics and other things seem more squishy and subjective um, whereas you know, how are you helping us achieve our goals as a community that we have another so we had a couple of ideas on that actually um, that didn't show up here because they came in after we after I'd already drafted and sent it out. Number one, as far as the location, we can certainly, you know, you could choose to move that up in the, in the you know, in, you, to level one or two. I think the other thing, you know, certainly downtown and growth center is, is clearly important, but we also do have zones for industrial law. They've got different names now, but for office parks and those kind of things, it doesn't mean we want to exclude, you know, we have a, a very, you know, one of the the Cabot uh, warehouse out on Gallison Hill Road, you know, that received it, and now it's paying a lot of taxes, and it's being out there, and we're, we've gained the benefit of that, and it could have easily been across the line in Berlin. So, you know, we have even, you know, I don't know what the jobs are, but just the actual grand list total was, was helpful. So we, if, we, if we want industrial development too, because that brings a different types of jobs, um, that's important. But anyway, to, to the point about aesthetics, because I agree, I think Glenn and I talked to this too, about how subjective aesthetics are. One idea, I think it was, this was actually Glenn's, um, was rather than make it that aesthetic, maybe simply say that they must provide a place for public art through the Public Arts Commission. So whether it's a, a mural on the wall or a space for a statue, and they don't have to actually build it. All they have to do is say, yes, you can put public art on our property. Uh, that has gone through our public arts commission pr process. And that would be something they're not required to do, but they could get an incentive. Another one that Mike suggested is, as we develop what we call it, what is it, the, the, what pl the open space? The green print. The green print and the, mm -hmm. the official map. So we're gonna be developing an official map that, that says here's where we'd like to have certain easements for trails or whatever, and, and it, basically allows the city to negotiate with a person when they want to sell their property, but we can't require them to give it to us. We talked a lot about that during zoning. You can't make them take it. But as a condition of a tax incentive, we might say, if you have a piece of property that's on our green print, then you can get top benefits if you agree that you'll make that available to the city or sign an option with the city or those kind of things. And you know, that's not a that's not a regulatory, that's an incentive. So, I mean, these are the kinds of things we could build in as well. Cool. Uh, Don? Is it possible to have a subcommittee and you all come back with a more clear draft? Yeah. Then I think our goal today was to see what was then go by line to by line. you wanted, yeah. where, where people's priorities but, were as far as building this in. But I, d I did want to back up what you said, because I do feel like it's, it's great to have businesses downtown, but I think we also have to bring in other kinds of businesses for other kinds of jobs on the outskirts. So I think it has to be balanced, that's all. Um, uh, I'm sorry, yes, Connor. Yeah. <coughs> I think kind of piggybacking off other people, it's, uh, this thing could be like 100 pages long, right? Like, <laughs> we can workshop it to death. Um, yep. And I, I think it's important that the baselines, and I'm comforted with the fact that I can vote no of any of these <laughs> with no real repercussions. But like, um, <laughs> you know, I, I think I want to get out of the mindset of like, okay, somebody coming in and saying, check, 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 give me some money, right? Uh, and it's kind of what Ashley's saying too. It's like, what are you bringing to the community? You gotta be like exceptional to get this. And it could be sort of an intangible thing that we're not even thinking about here, right? If I opened up a store and I said like, all right, I'm the only place in town you can buy basketball shoes for your kid as opposed to going to Walmart up the hill. That would be real value for me in this community, right? I think that's something that we don't have right now that appeals to like working class people, right? Um, so again, I think we could like go into this in great detail. Uh, I support the subcommittee idea, uh, but again, yeah, I'll probably vote no on most of these. <laughs> My, and that's okay. My only concern about that is, uh, uh, you know, people are trying to build their business and, uh, you know, trying to build a business on, uh, you know, the uh, intangibles is that would just be really hard. Um, I mean, you'd have to do, you could do it like really early in the process, um, but uh, just just thinking. Uh, yeah, that's a little long for the presentation. <laughs> Takes take some sell it, sell chocolate it, yeah. or something. Um, okay. Um, uh, Glenn? All right, so just uh, because it feels like we may be kicking this to subcommittee shortly, uh, yes. I want to put my two cents in um, with a couple of questions. Um, 
first, I think one of the the concerns that I have about it is that it feels like it uh, is very easily skewed toward larger, more well-established uh, businesses now. And I'm curious about how we can uh, look at changing that. So for instance, um, or, or at least why, if that skew exists, which, I, which it appears to me, and then why it might. Um, so, for instance, um, the first criterion for level one uh, is basically a, a, a threshold, a, a money threshold for application. And I'd like to hear an argument for why that threshold exists. Why, why should we be looking for uh, only projects beyond a certain dollar value on this? So I think the reason for that was, you know, because the city does gain the other half. Um, that if we, if there wasn't a significant sort of new revenue, why would we, you know, why would we create an incentive just for some small increment of, you know, if, as we said, a million dollar property is only twelve thousand dollar break to them and twelve thousand increase to us. You know, hundred thousand dollar property is going to be twelve hundred dollars. So if we're only gaining $2,400 or $1,200 out of this, why would we? So I think it was strictly a financial consideration. I think if you were to maybe take that out for a certain number of jobs or like, you know, that's why I, I took the money away just for housing units to say, yeah. if you just create housing units, you are eligible regardless of how much you're spending because that's something we want. And so I think we could put that in. But I think the dollar amounts are strictly to make it worth the city's while to get the money coming in. Yeah, and I, I, I think I understand that, um, and I do appreciate the the kind of lower threshold for things like, like housing or the, the different threshold. I guess, even so, uh, feels to me like uh, an incremental good is still a good, uh, and so if we get a, a whole pile of small good projects, that's that's good and we might want to encourage that so i'm not saying we shouldn't do that i'm saying yeah. that's why it was like this right. i mean this is your policy and you right. we could okay we could do whatever we want with that okay but then you might be getting a lot more applications that connor has to vote no on <laughs> <laughs> right and and when i put this question to to my partner kate uh she said basically that you you might just get buried in tiny little applications and i i'm curious whether that would really happen uh, if we took out the threshold entirely, I guess, if anyone has any kind of prediction on that. Uh, Jack? I have a couple of thoughts. Uh, one of them is uh, more general and one of them is more specific. I, whenever we do a tax stabilization contract, it, it is a tax expenditure. We are foregoing revenue. I know it is uh, very difficult to measure or to uh, to enforce the uh, the but for test, um, but I'm I'm just concerned if we don't have the but for test, I I think it takes some we should have some real discussion about well if we're not doing the but for test, why are we making the tax expenditure at all if if we think that. The, but for if we think this tax expenditure is not bringing the investment to the city, then because that seems to me like that's what eliminating the but for test means, then I think we just need to discuss that. Sure. Um, and then the other thing, which is a, a more <coughs> fine grain observation, when we look at the uh, at the city wage and we have a differential depending on whether uh, the job includes benefits or not, I think we need to have more specificity about what it means to say the job has benefits with it. Great. Um, Connor, then Glenn, then Steve. Uh, quick question. How much does the lowest, I don't know if I want to ask this, how much does the lowest paid city worker make? You know, I had that info and I, I'll, I'll get it for you. Okay, Glenn. All right. Uh, Next question I think might be easy to answer um, and might be, I don't 
don't know. Uh, this only applies to commercial development. Um, and that also seems like uh, it, it's not entirely clear to me why that's necessary. Uh, if I buy some land and build a house on it, that's good for the city and so should be encouraged. I have a build. very easy yes, answer to that. I thought that. you might. <laughs> the state doesn't allow us to do it, right? Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to make sure that that was it. Okay. okay. Uh, do you have that, if you're still looking? Oh, this, I'm looking that up, but I mean, the statute is right in there. Yeah, that, okay. Uh, so I, I, I'll get that. I tried to read that and didn't quite okay. understand it. That's right. And the final question I have, uh, I think, is still for Bill, so I'm just going to pile more questions on. I um, <laughs> wanted to follow up on one of Ashley's points about oversight over the, the length of the term. Say it's 50% for 10 years. Um, I feel like I read somewhere in there that we do check to make sure that, for example, the jobs still exist. And I'd like to hear just a little bit about that. So they're required to do an annual report. And we, through the assessor, will do spot checks and confirm with them and make them, at, le at the very least, sign a document that they're doing that. Um, but they, and we obviously check to see, I mean, what's the, most of, most of the criteria is either the jobs or the grand list value um, for the most part, and at least under the current policy. So we know that. We know that the grand list value has maintained. Uh, but if there were other conditions like putting in a boat ramp or something like that, we make sure that those, those conditions are still being met and that, um, because it is a contract, it's not a, and we have, I think there's something in there about the ability to, uh, Um, I'm hoping to get to see her. Is he going to find that lowest paid city employee? Yep, working on it. Okay. I'm almost there. <laughs> so our, our lowest full time rate is fifteen dollars and forty cents, with a forty with the forty five percent benefit. So it's a couple dollars higher than the state livable wage. Okay. So I apologize for not Steve Whitaker not having these thoughts as well organized. I'm no expert in tax stabilization, but I want to just make some observations. We recently witnessed the kind of race to the bottom with the Amazon second headquarters. Uh, we've heard uh, the phrase uh, privatize the profits, socialize the costs. Uh, we may be trying to contort ourselves into such a uh, pot potentially advantageous to the wealthy who can afford to develop uh, that we are selling all the rest of our citizens short. Um, this may not really be worth pursuing uh, beyond what we've already done. I, I just, the example, that on the other side, the example of why would you give, go out of your way for $12,000? You know, because your kid can get basketball shoes locally, right? I can't buy a men's shirt in, in this town. You know, it's, it, it, there are disadvantages too. Uh, but the idea that we, those who can afford to game the system and apply, who can apply a staff to apply for these stabilizations, that really is a, a not a finger on the scale, it's a, it's a foot on the scale. And Maybe we need to keep it very simple, that if you want to contribute and join into this community and build it, pony up. And the benefits are, will apply equally to everybody. But this idea of giving 10 years of, you know, 50% off your taxes is, is not something that the poor people and the renters who are paying the taxes for the landlords are going to agree with. Uh, so you're making decisions on behalf of people who aren't as uh, well off as yourselves. So I would caution that this may be a slippery slope that advantages the already advantaged at the expense of those who aren't. Thank you. Laura, did you want to say something? So, uh, Laura Gephardt, Montpelier Development Corporation. A quick one to reply to um, Steve's comments. Thank you. Um, and just kind of put it into context, uh, the development opportunities in Montpelier. Um, we're 
we're not, we don't have a lot of sites to be able to attract this, you know, the big fish. So in, in no way I, do I see this tax stabilization as an incentive that's really for some, you know, big business that really doesn't fit into Montpelier anyway. So I, I, I do want to frame that the tax stabilization is helping to incentivize something that you all want to see happen, whether it is efficient buildings or good jobs or growing the grand list. Um, it, we're not at the scale of some of these other communities who are doling out really big incentives. Um, and I'm very conscious of that from the economic development perspective. Um, few things. Um, so I wanted to read um, something from Shannon McIntyre and Timo Bradley. Uh, they weren't able to make it tonight, but they're from Timber Homes. Um, so they just wanted to share their perspective from the tax stabilization policy, just to give you some context there. Um, so our business, Timber Homes of Vermont, recently opened our shop doors on Elm Street in Montpelier. We've been operating out of a wall tent in Middlesex for six years and slowly growing the business. When the perfect piece of land for our shop came up for sale, we felt ready to move forward with buying and building in Montpelier, even though it felt like a colossal financial leap. The number of employees and the level of production had outgrown the wall tent, and we wanted to be a, be a more visible part of the community we all live in. We made this move carefully with our eyes wide open to the <coughs> fact that to build the facility we'd need, we'd be taking on significant low pay, loan payments for 30 years to come and a much higher tax bill. Uh, these factors push our business into a position of needing to meet certain of certain yearly revenue and needing a certain number of employees to do so. Needless to say, this has been an exciting and stressful year for our company as we grow into our new size, our new financial demands, and our new digs. I understand the perspective of some, some who feel it's not the city's job to give a tax break to businesses, so I'd like to share what the tax break me meant for Timber Homes. For us, getting approved for tax stabilization has felt like a sign of welcome. The city is stretching out its hand to shake ours as we venture forward saying, quote, I see your challenges and I want to support you specifically during your transition. If we continue on, the, on track this year, we will break even in 2019 as we spend resources finishing up our new shop. For our particular case, as a worker-owned cooperative, we intend that our business will outlast its ownership, its current ownership, and the city is therefore all but guaranteed a significant amount of tax revenue from timber homes long into the future. The tax stabilization that we received is a generous gesture from the city and also a drop in the bucket in terms of what we will need to spend this year to be in operation. I say this to point out that we are not getting a free ride by any means and in that, that, and that in practice, uh, the money we'll save, we saved allowed us to reallocate funds towards training new employees we just hired. As a resident, Resident of Montpelier, I would personally support moving to add additional requirements to being approved, including living wages for employees and energy efficiency standards. It's important to me as a member of this community that this program be targeted at businesses that have a positive impact uh, on Montpelier's residents and our footprint. Tax stabilization is a valuable tool for the city to welcome new businesses, and with a few tweaks could be a well-targeted incentive. So that's from Shannon. Um, the other thing I, I just wanted to provide you all with, um, so I did a really um, quick development pro forma. And um, so, sorry if this is confusing, I um, try to simplify it a bit and just kind of give the perspective of what a developer is going through from the cost and revenue um, perspective of any development project, um, and especially in Montpelier's market, the numbers are really tight. Um, and so with this performa, um, I got creative and did a three-story mixed-use building, um, presumably in the downtown, um, about 13,500 square feet, um, 4,500 uh, square feet per e for each level. Um, and with that, um, there's only a certain amount that you can actually lease out, so the other parts are for, you know, bathroom or ha hallway and kind of those unusable areas. Um, so when I applied the very, like, very average rents, um, this is assuming that these are average quality spaces. Um, apartments on the third floor, $20 per square foot, office on the second floor, $18 per square foot, retail on the bottom floor, $22 per square foot. 
So very average for our market. You can go a little lower, you can go a little bit higher, but that's pretty much the average. Um, you work in operating expenses, and per year, the, those that net in operating income, um, some of them got a little blurry, but it's $131,000 um, about for the cost to operate each year, or sorry, the revenues each year. When you look to the other side and look at the development costs, um, it costs approximately $150 per square foot to build new in Montpelier, um, and this is. This is where we start to see uh, the numbers get really close, where it, the cost to build is pretty similar all across Vermont, but when you go to some place like Burlington, you're able to acquire much higher rents. Um, and so this is where we are really tight in our market to making those numbers work. Um, and then I got to the end, and you know, with a, a project, for you to have the green light to even move forward and start applying for permits, you want a net operating income that's higher than your total cost of capital. Um, and that didn't happen. And I, before I left the office, I was like fiddling with the numbers. I like jacked up the, the rent prices. I really lowered the, the uh, interest rate on the loan. And like I was going all over the place. And I still couldn't get above that threshold of you know the costs were or the revenues were higher than the costs. Um, and so I didn't do a great job of that. But it, it's showing you like it's really hard to make a project work, any sort of development project. And so, and to have rates that actually work within our market that people are going to pay to open up their shop or to, have to you know, open up a new office. So when we talk about you know, new businesses that want to open up and try their, their concept, it's really tough to enter into a building with $22 per square foot into a, a first floor retail space. So that's where it gets a little, it gets a little challenging for developers to, to build and to get the, the return. There's a certain rent that they have to hit. And yet, so all to say, it's really tough to make the numbers work in this community. So any little bit helps, especially if we want to build in our downtown, if we want to redevelop brownfield sites, like that just continues to add to the cost. So you have the soft costs, which are architectural designs, engineering drawings, and add into that any infrastructure improvements that they're paying for the, for themselves. <clears throat> it really it starts to climb, and so I just I just wanted to put it into context: people aren't getting rich off of these develop developments. It's a really tight margin for any and all in this city. So just to again put that into context. So uh, I'm anticipating team that uh, we have. A lot more work to do on this, conversation to be had, and um, we, we did just talk about uh, having some kind of a working group uh, meeting to talk further about this. Uh, so um, that, does that sound okay to you, the group? I'm seeing a lot of nods, just so in general. Do you want council members? Um, so, so, so what's the subcommittee? I assume that meant council subcommittee. I, I had assumed a council subcommittee, but I think we should uh, um, you know, to Ashley's point about, you know, having a broad set of stakeholders, I think we could, um, I mean, it's obviously going to be a public meeting, but um, sort of be intentional about um, making certain, uh, you know, voices are at the table. Um, but <laughs> I guess my suggestion would be have a small council group and, you know, some staff people to flesh out the ideas and then hold a public, you know, public hearing and reach out to different groups because, Okay. It's yeah. Perfect. Sure. So. And and okay. it has okay. been you know voted on three times. <laughs> um, uh, so, thinking like maybe a group of three counselors, Max. I'm going to nominate Ashley Jack and Glenn. <laughs> well, I was going to also jump in there. I'm I'm sort of interested oh, okay. in this, but unless unless you. you, can you take my seat. Ashley, are you interested? Yeah. Okay. Glenn. Yeah. Okay. Is, if that's okay, Jack. Okay. Let me know if you have thoughts to add. Uh, okay, great. So we'll find some time. Oh, uh, Lauren? Yeah? I was just going to say, I mean, this is something that I think I'd be interested to bring to the um, social and economic justice group and get their thoughts. And I think a lot of this conversation fits into how are we, you know, positioning this within all of our priorities and how is this dealing with equity and other, other issues. So I will, I will do that. 
as that's kind of happening on a awesome. parallel track. Great, and, thank and you. And any suggestions that people have about priorities or your ideas, please <clears throat> send them to me and then we'll, we'll work that through the committee. And I'll just note one, one last comment from me at least is you're talking about the impact on the community. I just note uh, one last comment from me at least, you're talking about the impact on the community, some of Steve's uh, comments. I mean, this has been in place since 1980. Um, and we've done it, and in the first, you know, from 1980 to 2003, we had 26 of these, and some of them weren't large. And to be clear, if you're looking at estimated amount of the contract, that's the grand list amount. That's not the dollars, tax dollars. So just in case there's any confusion about that, so no one got a two million dollar uh, tax cut. It was only their ta their taxable value. You know, since then there's only been five. So it's not like this is something that happens a lot, and particularly that, that it really tracks with the, um, the change that we couldn't do the school tax. Um, and so I think, you know, it, it is people, the, the pro forma that, that Laura shared is very comparable to many conversations I've had with people about doing projects in town. And so, you know, this isn't something we do a lot of. Although, hopefully, if we have more development, we will. I'll check. Two quick observations. One, going through the, looking at the, particularly some of the considerations that uh, the draft adds, um, I think there are, there are city committees that are, whose work is relevant to that. Housing task force, there's, a, there's some energy stuff in there. And so asking those relevant committees to look at it, I think, would also be useful. Um, I also think that as a factual, I think this point will be lost if we don't, if I don't mention it now, which is that with the uh, abatement or a tax stabilization agreement we just did for the CVH project, I believe that at least some of those jobs are not jobs transferred from Berlin or Barry to here, they're new jobs because some of those jobs are for their uh, Epic uh, Center, which is a new software uh, package that they're rolling out and it's it's training and installation and implementation of their new software program so I think those at least some of those are going to be new hires who would have been somewhere else if, if they didn't go to Montpelier um, I just want to um, revise my previous offer I think I've in the last 30 seconds realized that I, I just don't I actually don't have time so if Jack if you are still willing <laughs> to be on it hey, Jack you can make sure okay. you reach out to all those groups yeah, yeah. okay <laughs> so I'm out just Got just it. making sure we're clear oh, Ashley did you have something uh, more I, I just I, I I'm I appreciate that this has been in place since 1980, but I can look at lots of policies that have been in place for a really long time, and um, I, I just I don't I don't find the fact that something has existed for a very long time as as a reason to continue to perpetuate it. Like I, I, I think it's a conversation that the city needs to have, and I think it's also I think it's also fair that it may be the kind of thing where people are like. We don't want to do this anymore. I, I mean, and, and I'm not saying that's on that's anything that I have proposed. I've proposed scaling it back significantly, but I just I I want to make clear that for me, simply because something has existed for a significant period of time, does not make it something that that is something that needs to continue to perpetuate itself. And and to be clear, my comment about that was not right. Just because we did something before doesn't mean we should do it again. It was that it has existed and has not really created financial hardship on the city. And in fact, you can see many successful projects, Hunger Mountain Co-op and other things that are, are big uh, contributors to the community. That was all I was saying. Final comment? Very brief comment. Uh, since you've just formed a new subcommittee, can I request that we allow people to be email notified of those subcommittee meetings so that? Uh, sure, it's subject to the open meeting okay. law. And if the end of the meeting or whatever I'd like to raise the issue I spoke with you about just because of the Sunday deadline that's coming up you'll have to refresh my memory but okay <laughs> I'm sorry We're about to have 30 or 40 oh yes yes that's right that's right that's right the Montpelier police interpret uh, a vague section of state law to make it illegal for those people who are about to be out on the street thank you okay um, so moving on, so uh, uh, do we know who's calling that meeting? 
by the way, of the subcommittee? Uh, Yielding, okay. Great, uh, all right, so moving on. So we're uh, on to a discussion about uh, the rec building. Uh, Sue. Sue Allen, I'm the Assistant City Manager. And uh, just briefly, I'll remind you that you had several meetings ago, a really robust, great conversation about how to proceed with the rec center. Um, went around the room and informally voiced support, no formal vote on, rather than building a new rec center with pools, to focus for now on the existing rec center and try to uh, get a handle on the costs and what it might look like to improve that building and there wasn't really a consensus i guess at that meeting about how to proceed so i'm trying to get a little more direction from the council specifically on how to proceed um, the proposal that i put forward and and it's up for discussion and and if you'd like to change it would be to um, contract with an architect to walk through the existing building and work with the senior center uh, the existing building and the consultant to come back to you with a range from uh, basically just getting the building up to code, getting it safe and slightly more usable, the bare minimum, to making it a sort of a premier rec center and what would be involved in the costs, the layout. This would not be a final architectural design. It would be just a quick look to give you a better sense of what your options are so that the council can make a smarter decision going forward. Comments. Okay, Donna. I guess I wanted to go to the next step sooner. <laughs> that I thought when when we got the proposal, and I'm sorry I, I don't remember those numbers, I was really hoping not to have to shell out another ten thousand dollars to do the minimum when we did some of the minimums before and got estimates. Mm. I'd really like us to be a little bolder and move forward but maybe we can't maybe we can't go to the architect and actually get a design until we do this step is that what you're telling me it just seems that we've already done the minimum I is that would, would you say that's true have we done the minimum sort of evaluation at this point well we know what the cost of putting in an elevator would be the guesstimate somewhere around three hundred and fifty thousand dollars but also to to do the minimum we'd have to redo bathrooms and mm -hmm. redo stairs we'd have to go down into the basement and figure out Know, is there lead in the building all of that so we're not a hundred percent sure the consultant guesstimated around one to two million but he said right up front he's not an expert which is why we would bring in an architect who is an expert to figure out what the cost of that would be versus I was, I going all out and and I'm guessing that you would like first a, uh, a, a breakdown on what it would cost to do the full Again, the architect guesstimated it would be about $5 million to do a total overhaul of the building. Uh, the consultant did, but he said it's not his specialty. So that, I would think you might want a slightly better nailed down estimate going forward. I mean, my ideal situation is that uh, there would be some uh, options even in between, right? So yeah. well, that we know, uh, what what the the minimum would be uh, and what perhaps the you know the the premium um, you know the luxury <laughs> option would be uh, but knowing that there's probably some steps in the middle you know if we yep. wanted to refurbish the basement or you know if that was um, something that we could isolate uh, as a cost or um, or just the bathrooms like that sort of as as you're saying but I'm I'm not sure what the different elements would be but I'm sure that. Uh, you know this process uh, my hope anyway would be that this process would figure that out and be able to assign some costs to that so we'd, we'd have some choices well, I like your point that if within the grand picture he, he, he or she did the projects so they were self-standing then we might do some mix and match or sure but okay sure I sort of yeah my feeling on this was just that if we're gonna go even if we go forward with the we're going to renovate the building. We're going to be asked, well, what would it cost to just do the minimum? And so we might as well have that hard number and be able to present this is this is the difference and this is what what we think we're getting for it. And well, I just, will these be the hard numbers, decision. or will we well, have to be wait harder than what we have now well, until the architect? So they're it. never hard numbers, really. You know, until you actually design something. I mean, I think this is, you know, people always want to know what the hard numbers are, and we care that you, know, you don't know the cost. Well, the fact is, you don't really know the cost till you get your bids back. Um, but what you do is, you know, you start with a ballpark estimate that the architect will, they'll apply square footage costs, so that'll be a better estimate. Then, 
you move forward into design and then you have real specific, you're gonna have so many inches of this and so many feet of this and then they put unit costs and then, then you've got a much, much better cost. But then you put it out to bid, and it could be high, low, depending on the market. So you, you know, I mean, you'll Darn. you never know. I mean, it's, well, there's, we we run into this a lot with people. Sort of, you know, how come you don't know the cost? And like, you, you know, it's like you do you do something on your house, and until you get your actual cost, you don't know. You're right. You're right. I'll be good. Uh, uh, I think we could probably use a vote on whether to move forward, eh? or unless Connor, yes. Oh, I was just gonna. Oh, go for it, yeah, yeah, you got it. Can I yeah, move to approve the proposal to develop cost estimates and the design concepts uh, for the renovation of the recreation center. I'll second. <laughs> Further discussion. I just wanted to raise one uh, question. Yes, Lauren. So having not been here when the decision was made to kind of limit the scope, so I, you know, was got the survey in the mail and filled it out diligently and with a kid I was like oh a pool would be so great and mm -hmm. get that that's not where we're going but I'm just thinking of public process and knowing how many conversations we're having on front porch forum and other things about public process and it seems like an opportunity to engage the public and make sure that like I didn't even know that this decision had been made so there's clearly some room for better uh, communication about how this process is going and ensuring that we're setting up a diligent process for, you know, okay, we get back a, a menu of ideas, which sounds great, and how are we getting input from people and engaging, especially because this was initiated with a citywide survey, so people were proactively engaged, which is great, but like the follow through on that. So just putting that out there, like I'd love, love a, plan, a public engagement plan around this, um, or slash communications <laughs> plan. Can uh, you comment on that, Sue? Are we planning to do that? Was that a part sure. of it? Sure. Well, well, we can. And the other thing just to add to this is, um, yes, the short answer is yes. We can, we can do a public, we actually sort of did do a public uh, engagement plan. It's, it's kind of hard to get the word out. I mean, but even once it's developed, I mean, it's, it is well, sort of worth going back. Plan, right? she, I mean, she did the survey, but it doesn't sound like she knew you did public here, it, public it, meetings out I, of City I, Hall around that. Like, I, I even had, like, yeah. seen the report, but I didn't know that that decision had been made. Yeah. So yeah. just yeah. as, like, a yeah. relatively yeah. engaged person, right. I didn't know, so I'm just guessing yeah. other people yeah. didn't. I think <laughs> we we do social media, we do press re releases and press reports. I think our interpretation the of the decision, too, was that the council expressed a preference to look at the Berry Street building and that we weren't gonna spend a lot more money getting final costs on a big building, but we knew it was in the 14 million range, and so we'd at least be able to say, okay, here's the minimum, here's Berry Street, and we know there's some big number out here, and then engage the public on sort of that range of options. I don't think it was that, definitely. Yeah. Well, I hear you too, and I, I mean, we're about to, once we, once we have the choices in front of us, uh, you know, we're gonna absolutely want a lot of input on, on that, so. Um, I mean, those don't those choices don't even exist yet. So, right. Yeah. So yes. Great. Great. Oh, uh, we need to vote. Um, further discussion. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Thank you. And the motion carries. Great. So. Um, Thank you. And I. Th I think that is the end of our uh, regular business. We're going to do council reports, all the other reports, and um, then we do have an executive session, uh, and we will not be coming out from that. Right? Well, we won't be voting. Well, we won't. We will come out. Come out. That's, that's <laughs> true. <laughs> <laughs> <You're> just <laughs> internal not executive. Not forever. <laughs> it's Woo. a hostile situation. <laughs> dun, dun, I thought dun. it was a meeting. <laughs> 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 Oh, this <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Okay, got to keep it together here. Ooh, okay. Uh, council reports. Uh, uh, do we, do you want to go to Steve? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, Steve. Yes. Now is now is great. Thank you. I recently became aware from folks who are staffing several of the shelters around, and I did some deep research in it, and I spoke to one of the police officers. There's a perception that Title Section 11 11 06 of Title 19 is a section of statute relating to public highways, right of ways, municipally designated areas for camping. And what I learned is that both of the overflow shelters that Good Samaritan runs, that the city relies on, uh, well, that the population relies on, 
uh, are closing this weekend for the season. And there's been over 20 people staying at Bethany, and there's at least a dozen staying at Heading. Okay. And anyway, they're all they're all being shut out. The Good Sam shelter is full at 30, and these people are intending to camp. Some of them already have backup camp ideas out of the park, or there you can see some on Route 302 and others. People know where you can see camping, but the idea that we're making inadvertently making outlaws out of all these people uh, just because we haven't really thought through whether or not we want to have a designated area or whether or not we want to supply a porta potty or you know I know this could be pushed back from the business community anywhere that you allow those less fortunate to uh, have a minimalist existence but you know it's something that merits attention and it's urgent because I, the idea that we're automatically criminalizing uh, behavior that is, <coughs> is not a, a criminal behavior is, is troubling to me. And I think government, need, government, including specifically this council, need to take a more active role and not rely entirely on the, the charity community to handle this. There's bridges to be built between, you know, casual labor jobs in the business community and some of these folks who need to step up. Um, but just even having a lawyer interpret Section 1106 and help us understand what that municipally designated means and whether that applies only to state highways or whether it applies to all municipal, because I don't think it's uh, illegal to be poor. <laughs> Uh, it certainly shouldn't be. Um, so I just call that to your attention, and I think that the sooner you can, uh, I would ask you to appoint a subcommittee to work on this between now and next meeting. Uh, um, Jack. Oh, do you have some? I was just going to respond quickly. T to my knowledge, um, we've never criminalized anybody. We've moved people who want to camp on downtown sidewalks and places, but do people stay? in all sorts of places around town. And in fact, our police are typically know where they are, check on them at night, make sure they're okay, particularly in cold weather. We'll, in fact, even we'll give them rides to the shelters if they're available. Um, so I don't think, you know, that we are criminalizing behavior. We do keep them, you know, I, I think, trying to find a balance. As you mentioned, the business community, you know, if someone's camping on a downtown sidewalk, we would probably move them. But there are many places where people stay and we're aware of and, and have not cited anybody for this. That said, I'm not saying those are the ideal places for people to stay, and we certainly could be looking for better solutions. But I don't think there's. Uh, an ag I want to rest everyone, you know, make everyone clear that we're not aggressively seeking to arrest people for yeah, being I, homeless. I did not mean to suggest that we were uh, aggressively criminalizing people, but in effect, what I've learned from interacting with some of these folks and the managers of the shelters is that they. These, in effect, I think this is where even where the zombie movies came from. These are people who, uh, through lack of privacy and lack of basic human support and dignity, are becoming less subhuman and avoided and, you know, cast. And, it, and it's not fair or right. And, and we owe it to ourselves and our own humanity to figure out how to reintegrate these folks. Um, Jack, did you have anything further? Well, the uh, problem of homeless people is a serious problem. Last year, this council repealed the uh, ordinance prohibiting begging, and uh, which I think was the right thing to do. This statute, 19 BSA 1106, has been on the books since 1985. I can't imagine that uh, anyone in, uh, certainly Montpelier, and I can't imagine there are many places that are enforcing it, but that doesn't mean that uh, homeless people's needs don't or shouldn't be addressed. We, I think they they need to be, um, and every night that someone doesn't have a place to live is it's an urgent situation for that person. But some and there's something else that we need to, to address. Um, anything further on? We've got our uh, 
priorities retreat coming up yeah. might be something to talk about yeah cool okay uh great thank you um again um council reports uh who would like to go first go ahead glenn um, I'll go first partly just because uh, one of the things I was going to report on was what Stephen just told us uh, and I got it from him so thanks for that Stephen um, otherwise uh, I want to call uh, folks attention to the, the newly installed watercolors uh, in council chambers um, Yay. Three and we have one. <laughs> <laughs> please turn around chair spin Donna <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, 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 our friend Philip Robertson, who is the curator at the Wood Gallery, uh, uh, found and, and provided these for us, and I'm really pleased to see them. Um, and we had a successful, I think, first meeting of the City Hall Art Committee, um, and look forward to more of those. That was a lot of fun. Um, otherwise, all I have is tomorrow morning, 8.30 to 9.30 at Baguitos. I look forward to talking with anyone who shows up. Great. Connor? Uh, not much. I attended my first uh, community uh, advisory board meeting uh, with the Community Justice Center. It was held in uh, Northfield, and it was, uh, I think it was really positive to see other towns sort of following the lead of Montpelier. Um, and I give particular credit to Chief Fakos, who you know, you can see he's really like leading by example and he's sort of a cop's cop and the other departments were sort of looking at him saying, okay, you know, sort of this reparative way of going about it is the way to go, you know? You can see him changing people's minds. Uh, Jamie was also there, um, I think representing the city manager and, and was tremendously articulate, just sharing some, you know, experiences she's had. Um, and you know, I, yeah, I was glad to be on the board and just very proud of the work Montpelier is doing. Uh, with our community justice center um otherwise i i sent it to bill and sue but i've got a draft of that um responsible contracting ordinance and i'll, I'll shoot that to the rest of the council the next day or so that's it for me thanks okay. anything on e-scooters uh yeah i to be honest on the scooters um really paying uh, close attention to what burlington is doing uh because it may somewhat limit our options as far as inventory uh, depending on what direction they go in. Um, you know, one thing, and I, the mayor and I have been on a couple of conference calls with some companies there. Uh, it, Nobody wants us. Well, no, it's a, like, like what's really appealing is the idea of getting like maybe some electric bikes in town as well, and yeah. some companies offer that. Uh, but it's really a matter of scale. Like one company said, you know, you need 250 electric bikes, and if 100 scooters freak people out, you know. Uh, hold on to your hat. Uh, so I don't think we're ready to like commit to that. But if you're, like Burlington's doing some stuff, we can absolutely partner with them. So I'm in so sort of wait and see mode before taking the next step. But we do have those survey results, and we'll try to put together a comprehensive. Sue and I just met on this today a bit, so we'll try to put together a good presentation for everybody soon. I know you love scooters. <laughs> well, people keep asking me, and, and one is, I still think we need to sit down and do an evaluation of what happened and how we would view it and maybe how we would approach it. But I didn't put you on the spot on purpose. I really, we'll wanted, to, I really wanted to know the information. <laughs> um, I, I need to talk about two things in the parks, uh, the Parks Commission men. And they did an experiment this last year. They were working with Mamba, a Montpelier it's, area mountain it's bike some, association. Yeah. Really area mountain, mountain bike, bike thank you, association. anyway, association. Uh, they have a, received a $50,000 federal grant, and they are, are going to be able to complete the mountain bike trails in the North Branch. And they went through last year um, experience both for walkers, skiers, bikers, and it was really amazing, very, very positive. There were some incidences uh, where, where bikers got off trail, but but uh, they're working together and by and large it was really deemed a success. They did realize that some of the features they put into a bike trail doesn't quite work for wa walkers, like certain bankment of curves and tables to jump off. So, but they're working on bypasses. So it was really great hearing people work together, the walkers, the bikers, and the park commission. And likewise, this last winter they did a flat tar, and that's my Ohio eye, sorry, uh, you know, the wheel and the bike, tire, yeah. Uh, and so 
it went really well, but also found out that they had a problem with signage. So there are a lot more signs, but they also need more maps because summer maps do not apply to the trails that happen in the winter. So just a lot of positive development, and this is also leaning into the Parks Commission is moving forward and working with the Justice Center uh, to do some facilitation on working on their mission and goals within the commission and then moving out to all their stakeholders sometime in the next year. So very positive news. Lauren, you good? Great. Um, I just wanted to share uh, the Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee is doing strategic planning that is um, looking ahead to the year and trying to map out um, some real to-dos and um, action items for the coming year. So if anyone is interested uh, in like looking at that and having any input on um, what that is going to look like, this is kind of the, the point of making some decisions over the next couple of weeks. So I'm happy to share if anyone's interested in the, if, there's a big matrix and I'm happy to just send it around and any, anyone who has time um, to, to look at that would love input to see is this in line with what the council actually wants um, that group to be spending their time on. Okay, I'll send it to everyone because um, it would be great to make sure that it's on track with <laughs> what everyone's hoping to see. Um, and, and then I just have a, confession that the um, Solid Waste Management District, I haven't been able to get to a meeting yet because of family conflicts, but I'm very excited for the next meeting. I can make it, so <laughs> look forward to reporting back from that. And Ellen's there, right? Yeah, there <laughs> yeah. <you go. laughs> Family scheduling conflicts. Again. Yes, family scheduling conflicts. Pass. Um, largely pass, although I am very excited to see of some of the plans. Um, I've been walking around a lot lately because some of the roads are just <laughs> a little rough. Um, and uh, the need for better lighting in certain areas where there are crosswalks um, is is painfully apparent. I don't, I don't often walk because I'm usually not in town at light hours, but um, so I'm excited to see that. Um, and that's it. Uh, so I just want to let you all know that I was finally able to get the uh, trash recycling compost group together uh, and uh, we didn't have a quorum <laughs> so we didn't take any official actions um, but uh, we um, uh, discussed the possibility of uh, putting out an RFP uh, to ask someone to do a study for us as to what it would even take to have uh, citywide municipal trash recycling uh, and or compost. Uh, and so um, one of our members um, uh, volunteered to uh, start a draft of a, an, uh, an RFP to get a basically a scoping study for that. Um, so more to come on that, but I just wanted to give you that update. Question? Solid Waste District should be able to help you. Yeah. Yeah, well, so they may help pay for the scoping study. Okay. Yeah. At one point, they did some composting pickups, so I just thought they... Yep, 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 and Ellen's all over that. Okay. Yeah, it was, it was great. So, uh, and that is it for me. Okay. Um, just note that um, we have our strategic planning next week, Monday and Tuesday. You should have all got something from forwarded from me, from Julia Novak. Uh, to, to be clear, you don't need to actually have filled out all that, but uh, but she did want you to have thought about those questions in advance to be prepared to discuss that. You don't have to do homework. Uh, one of you asked that question, and I did clarify. That. It might have been the teacher. It might have been the teacher who didn't want to do homework, teacher. right? It's possible. Uh, and otherwise, we are meeting tomorrow morning with the group, uh, the appellate group. Uh, about the parking garage, and so we'll be talking about that shortly. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I think we're just about ready to go, uh, well, move on to the next item. Uh, if we're going to go into an executive session, I think this is one of these things that requires two motions. I move that the council find that premature general knowledge of the status of negotiations regarding the parking garage will place the city at a substantial disadvantage by disclosing the state of negotiations and uh, the city's position in those negotiations. I'll second. Uh, further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, 
the motion passes. And then, um, so to go into executive session. I move we go into executive session to discuss the negotiations regarding the parking garage under Title I uh, VSA Section 313A1 something. <laughs> uh. Yeah, you got it. You got it. Uh, see how John writes that out. I, something, something. I was ready. Uh, there needs to be a second. A1 is fine. Is there, A1E. Is there a second? You always do it right. Second. Okay. Uh, further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carries. All right, and we will not be returning, wait, to take any official actions. Right. 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 There you go. That's the one. Okay. Phew.